Thank you very much for uh, coming to the 36th annual meeting of the, um, well, it's not quite annual, 36th meeting of the um, Agricultural Advisory Committee to the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. My name is uh, Randy Fortenberry. I'm from the School of Economics at Washington State University, so I'll be serving as the chairman. My primary job will be to try to keep us on topic and on time this morning. So. That's why we're trying to get started on time. A um, couple of quick housekeeping items. If you uh, haven't remembered to do so, please turn your cell phone either off or on vibrate. Uh, when it's your turn to speak today, uh, there's a red button you'll need to push in, on the microphone. But when you're done speaking, you need to turn it back off so somebody else can speak. So try to remember to both turn it on and turn it off. I think as we get started today, we'll first try to just be informal in terms of people uh, speaking up when um, the opportunity arises to comment. If that gets a little crowded, then maybe we'll start having to get people to signal me and we'll call on people. Um, I'd like to start the morning by introducing um, Chairman Gary Gensler, who has a few comments for us to get us started. Um, uh, uh, thank you. I'd like to thank the members of this committee for joining us today. And I specifically want to thank Randy, who's decided to take on uh, chairing this committee. This is a little bit different format. It's really that we were working with. Um, uh, our advisory committees and through the government processes uh, that uh, some other agencies and government said we maybe really should have, since it's an advisory committee, an outside chair, uh, but uh, I will be the sponsoring commissioner. So there's a small shift in that, but uh, uh, we're so delighted that uh, Randy was willing to uh, take on this chairmanship. Also, Krista, where's Krista? I want to just want to, uh, here. So if Krista stands up, uh, Lockemeyer, did I? Do that right? All right. Um, who is serving officially as the committee's designated <laughs> federal officer. What does that mean? That means Krista is the person who, if you need something or you have a point of view or you want to get some advice to us and you can't get me on the phone or Randy can't get us on the phone, Krista is actually a term, the designated federal officer, which is in the charter. Right, Krista? So you don't, she can't, doesn't get to hide. Um, I also um, uh, uh, want to thank uh, my fellow commissioners, Commissioner Mark Weijin, who is here today. Um, I know that Commissioner O'Malley will be joining us. I think that Commissioner Chilton is on phone, but I, I want to just pause to see if he is. I think he has a one-way line. Oh, he has a one-way line. And I also want to take a moment to uh, recognize and thank uh, former Commissioner Mike Dunn. Uh, who I see here today, but Mike uh, chaired uh, this group. Uh, he's chaired it so well that no commissioner could stand in his shoes, and we now have Randy standing in your shoes, Mike. Um, uh, but uh, good to see you, Mike. And uh, it, this, this group and the advice and input of its members, not only as a full committee, but each of you is, and your membership, uh, has really been critical to the CFTC's mission. Um, and. This meeting comes at a particularly time uh, 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 in our regulatory processes that your advice is critical. We are nearly done uh, all of this financial reform regulation called Dodd-Frank, uh, but it's being implemented. And today comes at a time that it would be really helpful just to hear your feedback. How's it going? Uh, what's going well? What's not going so well? What adjustments or flexibility should we show? Uh, particularly as it relates to farmers and ranchers and producers and merchants and the agriculture interests that you know so well. It also comes at a time that the Commission is looking uh, uh, at a process of finalizing some rules around enhancing customer protection. A lot's gone on, of course, as, as you know, uh, in this field. A lot of good work by the self-regulatory organizations, a lot of good work here at the CFTC. Uh, but we are looking to uh, possibly finalize some rules around this area in the fall, and your input at this critical time is uh, very uh, helpful. With respect to swaps market reform, uh, we'll update you and we'll hear your views, uh, but it's really about making sure that farmers, ranchers, producers, merchants, and others that use these complex uh, products called derivatives uh, work for you and the agricultural community. And though the vast part of the markets are in interest rates and credit derivatives and so forth, just peering into the data repositories that we now have, uh, you can see there's actually, uh, and I was just handed these figures, and these may be a rough, but to give you a sense of size, 
uh, agricultural swaps in the um, data repositories, about $200 billion in notional. So, you know, for most Americans, that's not a small figure. Uh, it's not the large numbers in the interest rate swaps, but it's still a pretty relevant number. Energy swaps, or more broad commodity swaps, are about $2.5 trillion. Um, I think these numbers will grow in size because key reporting dates are still in front of us come mid-August. Uh, mid a lot of new reporting will come into the data repository. So this is not a full picture uh, uh, yet. The overall swaps market, as you, you probably know, is greater than $300 trillion in size, but those numbers are significantly in the interest rate swap market. And again, I think uh, the agricultural swaps, whether it's $200 billion or a trillion, it's really relevant to the hedging and, and lowering risk uh, to in your community. So we look forward to hearing from you. And um, I, uh, I turn it back to Randy, uh, who I assume uh, will let uh, my fellow commissioners say some things if they wish. Yeah, so to my left is uh, Commissioner Mark Weijin, who I think has a few comments for us as well. Commissioner Weijin. Thanks, Dr. Fortenberry. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. And thanks to everyone who's here today for being part of this important first meeting of the Ag Committee Advisory Committee, uh, at least since I've been at the Commission. So um, it's great to have this group assembled. And um, we've been spending, a lot of us have been spending a good amount of time with folks from the ag sector uh, this week. I was up in Congress, and I think maybe some of the others around the table <laughs> were also testifying this week in the House Ag Committee. Um, so I just want to thank those represented here um, for bringing a lot of good, useful attention to some key areas in our remaining rules, um, uh, where the ag interests in particular had a, had a, had a perspective that was important um, to understand. The most important issue I would identify is this residual interest issue in our customer protection rulemaking that we hope to finalize very soon. So I think um, the committee has done a very, very good job in highlighting this issue and, and making sure those of us here at the commission fully understand it uh, as we as we um, get through these next few weeks before considering a final draft and hopefully finalizing something very soon. So I just want to thank everyone for being here and and uh, thank you for your advocacy on, on some of these important issues, both in the customer protection space, but also with respect to some of our other rulemakings. It's been it's been very helpful. So thank you. I think, uh, like myself, several of the, the advisory committee members are new, maybe new to the process, certainly new to this committee. So perhaps the place to start would be for us to introduce ourselves to each other before we get to the first topic. And we start over here on the left. Don't forget to push your button. Kent Longcloud, Risk Management Agency. I'm John Owen. I'm a uh, rice, soybean, and corn producer from Northeast Louisiana. And I'm also incoming chairman of the USA Rice Federation Producers Group. Jim Baer, North American Millers Association. Steve Strong with uh, North American Export Grain Association. I'm uh, also with Bungie in St. Louis in charge of corn risk for North America. I'm Neil, <clears throat> I'm Neil Dirks. I'm the CEO of the National Pork Producers Council. Good morning. My name is Ed Gallagher. I'm representing National Milk Producers Federation today. I'm employed by Dairy Farmers of America, and I'm their president of their DFA risk management program. I'm Ed Luttrell. I'm the president of the National Grange. I'm MJ Anderson with the Andersons in Maumee, Ohio, uh, here representing National Grain and Feed Association. Hi, Brittany Jablonski with the National Farmers Union. Hi, good morning. Uh, Scott Cordes, uh, representing National Council of Farmer Cooperatives. And in my uh, normal day job, I'm president of CHS Hedging. Kurt Friesen from Nebraska, uh, representing National Corn Growers. Um, I'm a producer who uh, actively uses the CME for hedging, raised corn and soybeans. Paul Penner from Hillsborough, Kansas, uh, a farmer from there, as well as uh, first vice president of National Association of Wheat Growers. Jennifer Hahn from Managed Funds Association. I'm Bob Yonkers with the International Dairy Foods Association. I'm Don Reynolds. I have a small rural bank in northern Missouri. I represent the Independent Community Bankers Association. I'm John Hayes with the Farm Credit Council here in Washington, D.C. Uh, 
I'm Steve Wellman, chairman of the American Soybean Association. I farm in uh, southeast Nebraska, soybeans, corn, and some wheat. Dave Miller, a director of research with the Iowa Farm Bureau, representing the American Farm Bureau and also a producer of corn and soybeans in southern Iowa. Bill May, president and CEO of the American Cotton Shippers Association, which represents uh, U.S. cotton merchants. Diana Preston with the American Bankers Association. David Center with the American Agriculture Movement. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, what we're going to do, we have a pretty full agenda today. We're going to start off with an overview of the Dodd-Frank legislation and, uh, and the um, uh, status of its implementation. We have two presenters this morning. Um, okay, uh, so there's going to be three presenters this morning. Uh, the chairman's going to participate as well. But uh, we have uh, Leanne Duffy from the Office of the General Counsel and uh, Lori Gosso from the Division of Market Oversight uh, to sort of kick us off this morning. Take it away. Um, I was going to make only the briefest of introductions. Uh, the Dodd-Frank Act uh, established a comprehensive new regulatory framework for swaps. The legislation was enacted to reduce risk, increase transparency, <laughs> and promote market integrity within the financial system. Um, under the Dodd-Frank Act, the CFTC now regulates swap dealers requires standardized derivatives to be centrally cleared, requires standardized derivatives to be traded on regulated exchanges or swap execution facilities, and oversees a new swaps reporting and record keeping regime. And uh, Lori's going to talk about reporting and record keeping. Thank you, Leanne. Um, with the implementation of Dodd-Frank, um, there was one area um, of trans, um, transparency which um, I have been involved, and it is with respect to the reporting of swap data to swap data repository, and in addition, the public dissemination of certain um, um, price and volume information regarding those transactions. So. Um, if you, just as a general overview, I'm sure that all of you are quite familiar with the regulations um, that were passed um, back in July and, excuse me one second, July and, my apologies, December of 2011 um, for Part 45 and Part 43, and then in June of 2012 for Part 46 for the historical <coughs> record keeping. Um, in addition to having the regulations in place, for, um, which you guys have been involved in um, from the, the, in the beginning, um, we have those in place for about 18 months now with respect to 43 and 45. We've also got the provisionally registered SDRs um, in um, CME, of course, DTCC, and <laughs> I'm so sorry, I straight ball. So we've got the players, we've, we've got the rules, and um, so we have deadlines for reporting. Um, and so with respect to the market participants, um, you know, we, we have the um, implementation phased in based upon your status as a market participant. So we had the swap dealers, MSPs, um, reporting um, with the first phase in. Then, of course, we had the financial entities, and now we've had the first round of um, reporting for the non registered entities. Um, as some of you may have already b began reporting on July 1st with respect to your um, interest rate and um, credit um, default swap transactions. And then we have our last um, phase of the implementation with respect to um, reporting going live August 19th with respect to the other three asset classes, um, other commodities, um, um, equities, and foreign exchange. So in addition to those, those basic um, time frames, we, we have some additional, you know, time to report the um, historic data and some other, you know, backloading if you've been um, relying on no action relief for, for reporting um, between the compliance date of April 10th and, and these delayed time frames that, that we just discussed. Um, and when we talk about reporting, we have, of course, the Part 45, which is the regulatory reporting. The data goes to the SDR. Um, that's confidential data um, available for the regulators. And then in addition, um, if the swap is a publicly reportable swap transaction, there are certain um, price and volume information 
that is sent to the SDR, which the SDR publicly disseminates um, on its website. And so you can see transaction by tra transaction um, information about um, basically whatever um, has been sent to the SDR that is publicly reportable. And like I said, that information is on each SDR's website. It's currently, um, um, you know, those websites are currently in effect. Um, the data is currently being publicly disseminated. So if you haven't had the opportunity to review it, you might, you might want to check out and see what is available. Um, my apologies. Okay, so one um, common question is um, who reports? And sorry. <laughs> who reports? So there's a reporting hierarchy set forth in um, Part 45. And again, we start with the, um, the swap dealer. And then if there's no swap dealer in the transaction, um, the major swap participant would be the next reporting counterparty. If there's neither a swap dealer nor a major part market participant, then the financial entity, a financial entity, um, would be the reporting counterparty. If none of those entities are involved, or shall we say if, they're, um, we, if there's two swap dealers, two market um, MSPs, or two financial entities, there's a tiebreaker provision um, that sets forth how um, the decision will be made. And then, of course, we also have to look at whether it's a U.S. person versus a non-U.S. person. And um, in these instances of a tiebreaker, um, the tiebreaker situation or transactions with non-U.S. persons, we have to look at where the transaction is executed, whether it's on um, a platform or bilaterally. So um, again, this is um, set forth in the rule. And um, at the end, you will see um, all these resources are available online. So we've been really um, um, careful and diligent about providing this information so that it's easily acceptable, uh, ac accessible to, um, to you and anybody else that's interested in looking. Another common question we get is with respect to reporting and record keeping, which Part 45 um, requires both reporting and record keeping, as you're aware, um, there's a, a unique identifier to which each counterparty to a swap must be identified. Um, the, that, and, um, Identifier is called a legal entity identifier or an LEI. Right now we're in the phase in um, process and we're using an um, interim identifier called a CC. And if you have not yet um, checked it out, you may want to go to the CC utility, which is um, publicly, a publicly available website, to um, register if, um, for a CC identifier. And there's um, a wealth of information on that, that website, um, including frequently asked questions. And so, um, that should be able to assist you in the registration process. It's a very quick process, very easy. And um, so, each, again, each counterparty to a swap that is reportable must obtain a, an LEI or in the interim ACC. Um, and again, another um, very um, active area of conversation is, is what, what relief is available? We understand um, the, the end user or the non-registered entity um, is, is coming late to this. Um, the, I, the swap dealers and MSPs have been involved in, in, in preparing for this for, for a while now. So um, we are trying to provide the end users with as much information as possible. And so um, I've provided on the screen just a, a general list of no action relief letters that are currently available on the website um, that provide, um, you know, that address several different um, report, reporting scenarios and who the um, eligible participants are for, um, for relief and, and the relief involved. And again, this is um, on the website and, and easily accessible. Okay, and, and like I said, all this information is, is available to the public. I've, I've given you know the, the commission's um, website, um, all the rules are up there, um, the, the registered SDRs, which asset classes they support. We have frequently asked questions, um, Q&As, we've got fact sheets about reporting, and, and again, the reporting relief. And so um, just, just, just to walk you through at a very high level, because um, I, have, I've got, I have received calls from um, outside counsel that, that haven't, you know, haven't gotten here yet, so maybe this would be helpful. So if you just go to Law and Regulation and Dodd-Frank, one of our favorite places to look, there's a, a list of rulemaking areas. If you go there and then you can, um, you can find under these tabs all the information that, you know, we've 
provided to you today in addition to information that I haven't even touched upon. So, so you know, we're here to answer questions and we're here to help you, uh, you know, remain in, in coming to compliance with the reporting rules and hopefully the, we're providing the information for you to do so. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take it to maybe just a little higher level than that detail, and as uh, Leanne did, there are really three broad areas uh, that have all been implemented in this financial reform. And then there's there, there's so much detail and 50 to 60 finalized rules. The financial crisis was such that Congress asked to bring common sense rules of the road to this uh, esoteric and complex market called swaps. Transparency, we've completed our various rule sets on transparency, and now there is transparency in this marketplace. To the regulators, as I indicated earlier, and as uh, uh, Lori has put in more detailed tone, that there are data repositories, there are three of them now, but there are data repositories that collect data from market participants so that the regulators can see the full scale and scope of the marketplace. Um, there's always more work to be done, but that is now in place and it's been phased from last December through the last phasing date, as I think as Lori just put out, uh, August 19th. Second part of transparency is public market transparency. You all can actually see the price and volume of transactions as they flow through the system. They're time delayed uh, and they've been uh, being reported since last December and again phasing through this August 19th, various time delays and so forth. Uh, but you can see the price and volume uh, with the counterparty information masked, of course, uh, similar to a modern day ticker tape. And a third part of transparency is that if you wish to, uh, starting shortly, you could actually go on to a centralized market structure, whether that's called a designated contract market like you've used in the futures world, but shortly uh, uh, a, a platform called swap execution facilities. Now, you might think that primarily this will be for interest rate swaps and credit swaps and some of the high volume swaps like that, but if a trading platform uh, wishes to offer agricultural swaps, there are rules of the road in place that they'll have to offer you various ways uh, to transact and they'll have to uh, uh, send that information on your behalf to the data repository. So it might even be that you want to transact an agricultural swap uh, or an energy swap on one of these swap execution facilities. They will start registering and being uh, up and alive uh, as soon as, uh, I think it's about two weeks from now, August 5th, and they need to register by uh, early October. Uh, that's all in place already, but there's a lot uh, to come uh, ahead on this uh, transparency initiative as these swap execution facilities come alive later this year. A second main piece of Dodd-Frank was lowering risk, and it's lowering risk through central clearing, as well as lowering risk through the oversight of dealers. Central clearing was a commitment uh, of the futures industry for about 120 years, um, but now it's come to the, uh, the swap marketplace for financial enterprises. So most of you have a choice. You don't have to involve yourself in central clearing. What uh, Congress uh, pointed out and, and we've really kept uh, in mind is that non-financial parties, farmers and ranchers and producers and millers like yourselves, um, but retail companies and software companies and manufacturing companies get a choice whether to use central clearing. But for financial entities that make up about 90% of this derivatives market, truly about 90% of the derivatives market are financial companies, um, that they use central clearing to lower the risk of an interconnected financial system. And that uh, this commission finalized rules, robust risk management rules for the clearinghouses, finalized rules that on key interest rate swaps and key uh, credit derivative swaps that they must be brought to the, uh, to the clearinghouse. And that phasing has been since March of this year through September of this year. 
but as I say, as, as end users, if you're using an interest rate swap or using a credit derivative swap, uh, I, I would find it pretty unlikely that you'd have to, you know, involve yourself in central clearing. I think there is one um, uh, information thing that you have to file at an SDR, uh, just that you are an end user. Uh, and that might be by September some date. I can't remember the date in September. And then the other way we're lowering risk is regulating the dealers. The large banks here in the U.S., the large banks around the globe, they started registering with us in December of last year. But it means as you face a large bank, their registration means they are now subject to various business conduct rules for, on their sales practice, various rules that we have in place about making the markets fair and less subject to abuse, but also business conduct rules to make sure that they manage their risk better, that they confirm their trades, that they have various documentation for their trades and so forth. Um, so those are the main things that have occurred. Uh, and throughout the process, uh, we've been listening. We've uh, worked with the agricultural cooperatives and others around this table to ensure that you don't get caught up in maybe the swap dealer definitions and so forth. But it would be really helpful to get your advice uh, on how you've seen this reform. Because as I said, we're well past 90 percent finished the various uh, regulatory issues. We're probably well past half uh, way in terms of implementation, and this meeting couldn't come at a more timely moment to just hear from you as to what's working, what's not working, what where, what tweaks or adjustments are appropriate. Uh, and uh, I think this commission uh, and any commission really needs to be uh, adjusting over time. I see Mike Dunn again. Mike said as we were voting for these rules that we should always stay and stand ready to adjust. And um, I, I I share Mike's view. Uh, on that. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Leanne Warren and Chairman Gensler. Before I uh, throw it open for questions or comments, let me just ask, can everybody hear okay? Any problems there? Please make sure when you're speaking, you speak into the microphone for two reasons. One, so the rest of the committee can hear, but also we're recording this uh, for the purposes of constructing minutes of the meeting later, so it would help if we actually knew what was said when it's said. Any questions or comments about the Frank Dodd implementation, the act itself, for any of the three uh, presenters? Yes. Just one comment. I'd give some feedback. You asked how things are going, that kind of thing. Some of the things that we're seeing in the industry is there's some confusion about what applies to who and where. Uh, sometimes with some of the swap dealers that the co-ops are dealing with, some are saying, okay, you've got to clear it, you don't, end user. So there's just some confusion that needs to be worked through and a better understanding of what applies to who and when and where. So that, that's helpful. And if you do have specifics, particularly as it relates to uh, uh, agricultural interest, please don't hesitate to, to let us know. Um, the clearing mandate is, of course, just these four big interest rate curves and some credit derivatives. I doubt many people around this table use credit derivatives, but maybe. Um, uh, but, but please do, if there's an issue, don't hesitate to let us know. Other comments or questions? I just want to follow up. Uh, um, with the with the last question, does it seem as though that's, and I, I don't ask this question um, suggesting any skepticism on my part, I'm just trying to better understand things, does it seem like that's more a function of people starting to comply for the first time and so um, are these questions anything out of the ordinary or is it more of a reflection of the rules being not as clear as they should be or um, market participants seeking answers from the agency and they're not getting answers uh, either soon enough or the answers aren't sufficient? Or is it a combination of those two things, would you say? I think it's probably a combination. I think uh, probably the biggest challenge is there's so many things coming so fast that as these milestone dates hit, people aren't quite up to speed on what's required and trying to get that understanding. So I think maybe some clearer timelines back or clarification on some of the things to help the participants would be helpful. Yes, sir. 
when I've um, visited with my local grain elevator and in my hedging, um, what they're doing is they're, they are very confused about who is required to report and things like that. They don't know if they're a swap dealer or not. Um, but one thing that they did bring up, and, and as farmers get more um, adapt to using more risk management tools, uh, these elevators are trying to develop products that help us market grain, and some of those they feel are considered swaps. So if, I mean, the dollar amounts they're talking about are so small, could there be a, a floor in there where anything below that would not need to be reported? Or Because uh, they're coming out with new products all the time, and in order to use some of these tools, I, I do think some of them are going to be considered swaps the way they describe them. So if something could be done to, I guess, we need all the risk management tools we can get. Um, I appreciate their efforts to try and make it easier to market, but they need to be clarified, I guess. I'd, I'd like to follow up on that because we've, we've seen some of the same in, in the dairy industry. And uh, certainly some of the swaps we contemplate writing are going to be pretty small notional amounts that um, are not going to be any type of an issue, any, any way, shape, or form in the security of the economy of the United States. The other, the other thing that we're finding is that, um, you know, we've built this house, and we've all got this new house that we're getting used to uh, um, living in, and uh, some of us have some special needs because our industry is a little bit different, and we've got these um, new utilities, say, and the operating instructions are a little bit vague, and we're not quite sure how to operate them. And in, in some cases, one particular um, um, issue that we're running across uh, as a dairy cooperative is that we have a lot of marketing contracts that have volumetric optionality in them um, in order to, um, we're kind of like the, uh, or the dairy grid, like the electric grid. We make sure that whoever wants milk can get their milk and we move milk around so that everybody gets what they need when they need it. And so we have a lot of volumetric optionality into our contracts. My reading of those is that they are not swaps, but it's not important what my reading is, it's important what yours is. And it's vague enough that it gives us some concern and so we'd like to um, at some point have some more dialogue about just better understanding what would fit into probably the seventh um, seventh part of the of that particular um, set of rules? So it's just continued dialogue. We appreciate the dialogue that we've had to date, and we really appreciate the flexibility that you've shown the agricultural industry. I just had a quick response to that. I appreciate the the question and raising this. Um, that was part of our swap definition rule about a year ago, and that. Uh, volumetric optionality test that you referred to was something that uh, we did on an interim basis, which is to say we sought additional comment um, on the seven-part test that you referred to. Uh, so I guess my first question is, um, has your group filed a comment letter in response to that? Because I think when we were working through that at the time, most of the, focuses, most of the focus was on the uh, utility, electrical utility space and less so on the dairy space. So I'm kind of interested to hear you say it might impact you. And then, and then secondly, um, regardless of whether you did, well, if you, did, if you didn't file a comment letter, you, I would urge you to do that. Um, and then secondly, that's probably something, um, since it's been out for comment for some time, maybe we, we think about redressing at some point soon. I, I would share Commissioner Regent's thoughts that, uh, Ed, if, if what, even if you filed one because now you have a year of experience, you might want to refile something because it may change. It would just be helpful. Or if you feel that uh, you want to just set up a meeting, uh, I'd look forward to it, and I'd certainly take the meeting. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Leanne. Um, I also want to add the, the, the team, the staff team that worked on the products definition still consults on questions um, of the products definitions. So, so you can contact me or um, Dave Aaron, um, and we'd be happy to speak with you as well. I think that Leanne raises a very good point that uh, staff stands ready, even at our small agency and time permitted, uh, to deal with, frankly, the hundreds of questions that come up. Um, 
And as Commissioner Weijin said, on the volumetric options, it ge has generally been questions from the electric utility field. Uh, but uh, whether it's Leanne herself, Leanne helped write some of those provisions. Um, and, uh, and Dave Aaron, who she mentioned in our Office of General Counsel. But uh, often it can be uh, addressed through um, staff interpretation as well. Any other comments or questions? Yes. Um, uh, as American ba Bankers Association, I would have to say we represent uh, in interest on all sides of the equation here. And I think we're often uh, seen as the largest, most active players. Um, we also encompass the smallest players that do swaps, in some cases, once every five years. So I'd have to say I appreciate the dialogue that we've had with the commission. I have found the staff extremely responsive and willing to listen. And I think some of what you were asking about, Commissioner Weijin, you know, what are the challenges here? Some of them are new market players that have come in. For example, we dealt with um, uh, new trade affirmation platforms, which the dealers and the end user banks and the, um, the banks in the middle all had to deal with, and it was very challenging. We appreciated the staff's time in listening to us. We appreciate the accommodation in terms of saying that there will be some uh, accommodation in terms of enforcement actions while this all sorts itself out, because we really do represent banks on all sides of this, this equation. Uh, uh, an, an issue that I uh, had the opportunity to speak to your staff about relative to uh, um, our members, but I'm curious if it if it goes beyond our members. So I'd like to ask the group a question about the LEICCs. So one of the things that I've seen is that uh, for a dairy farmer, they're invested in their operation for decades, and they're not moving anywhere. Um, and so my question was, why why would a a dairy farmer need to have an annual um, resubmission and an annual repayment for an LEICC when they're going to have the same um, address for decades so that um, we know where they're going to be. And I was just curious if there were uh, other agricultural, uh, you know, other um, farm farm based groups that had the same thought or the same idea as opposed to having to have a farmer um, pay an annual fee for an LEI when they're in the same place all the time. Any comments? Any responses to that? I guess I have not heard of that. Uh, Any more discussion? Yes, sir. I just made to to Ed's question, I would suggest that I think it, there's a lot of sense to that <clears throat> from the producer's perspective. I know some of our members that have have started to use swaps um, in agriculture is the same kind of thing. I mean, they're pretty identifiable. They've been there forever. And as you'd sign up, if there's some way of just you're in, you're a, you do the LECC and it just doesn't need to be renewed. It just should until maybe it's either or a longer period of time might work better for renewal I, I'm not close enough to it and a lot of this is also at the data repositories themselves but for data integrity uh, I think the the um, best technologists have once told me that you want to have some time whether it's once a year in some circumstances you have to do it more often or less often but some time just to make sure that you still have the right party and the right number. It's sort of like telephone numbers change and cell phone addresses change. But I, I believe that's why the interna international regime, and when you use the term LEI, legal identifier, that's an international regime. That, um, so uh, even, even at a Morgan Stanley or Goldman Sachs, they're, well, they'd like to think they'll be in existence a long time too. Um, but there's, there's this some uh, need to refresh for data integrity. But I don't know why it landed on once a year. And that may be some international arrangement. So 
along the lines of, I guess, the LEIs and CCs, so we've been in the futures markets, our members, for a long time, and so in the swaps markets, and so we, you know, we appreciate all the work the Commission is doing. We know it's been a lot of rulemaking. Um, one thing that we would like to make sure is that with, as we are moving into this new house, as you've made, uh, as you've raised it, this new framework, and just making sure everything is working correctly. We want to make sure that all of the information kept at the swap data repositories are maintained um, in a confidential manner. Our members have um, been aware of instances when trade data has been released to the counterparty, and so we're quite concerned about that. The futures markets have been working, and so, you know, it's there haven't been problems, but here I think at this initial phase we have seen issues, and so we would like for the commission to, you know, ensure that um, swap data repositories maintain the data confidentially and make sure that, you know, both sides of the transaction that they're not aware of who their counterparty is, and so that's something we'd like to emphasize. Um, since we're in the Agricultural Forum, I would be remiss in not pointing out that um, we have a clearing mandate that has gone and been implemented through um, many parts of the marketplace, but that there is a proposed exemption from clearing for cooperatives, for, for farm credit. And um, while we appreciate that uh, farmers need access to agriculture, I again reiterate that we represent banks of all sizes and all different marketplaces and do have some serious concerns about a proposed exemption for cooperatives. Farm Credit in particular has a swaps portfolio of $26 billion and it seems like there is something um, that contradicts the mandate that the Commission has for central clearing. Just want to point that out. Time for one more comment or question before we take a quick break. Anybody else, uh, anything they'd like to get on the table? Okay, thank you, Leanne and Lori, for your time. Uh, one thing I failed to mention is the slides that you see presented today will all be available to you after the meeting, so anything that pops up on the screen, you will have access to at a later time. Why don't we take about a 15-minute recess? We'll return at uh, 1030. So there's coffee in the back, water. Um, feel free to introduce yourself to the rest of the committee members, and I'll see you in about 15 minutes. Randy, the oh, next sorry. subject is customer protection. Yes, the next subject is customer okay. protection. Thank you. Thank you. We have uh, two more topics that we're going to discuss before lunch. Uh, the first one is on customer protection this morning, and then we'll um, have a short session on ethanol and RINs, uh, most specifically RINs, uh, re renewable identification numbers. But the first thing we're going to do this morning is talk about um, the customer protection. We have a panel to address uh, the issue for us. Uh, Ann Bagan, who's the managing director of the CME Group, uh, is going to be on the panel. She'll speak first. Uh, Gary Barnett, Director of the Division of Swap and Intermediary Oversight. I'm tripping over the word. And uh, Kevin Piccoli, Division of Swap Dealer and Intermediary Oversight. So, Ms. Began. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, after the um, unhappy events in our industry over the past couple years, a number of industry groups were put together to um, look at whether there were ways that we could enhance customer protections. Uh, I believe the FIA put together, I think they were called the Financial Management Group. One thing they did that I would highly recommend you read if you have not, they put a um, FAQ together on how customer segregation works. It's an excellent document and it's very good for customers, I think. Um, so they put a group together to look at potential enhancements. Uh, the NFA also put a group together for self-regulatory organizations, and participating on that were CME, Minneapolis, Kansas City, and ICE, and we also were looking at ways um, that we could suggest enhancements to customer protection. Those, those two groups actually came up with many of the same ideas, and um, so we have put those in place, and I'll go through what some of those are real quickly, but uh, these uh, suggestions and rules that we've put in place have also been proposed by the CFTC in their recent rulemaking, so um, the whole industry, I think, is on board together. So our goal here was to have greater transparency, uh, increased detection, and increased deterrence from 
situations where customer funds could be potentially lost. And um, one thing that we put in was that all FCMs now must report all customer segregation computations to their designated self-regulatory organization, which would be either CME or NFA, on a daily basis. Um, NFA had been doing that. CME did it um, on a for-cause basis, but now we're requiring all of our FCMs to submit those reports to us. To date, for just 2013, we CME has received um, approximately 15,000 of those reports, which need to be reviewed every single day. Uh, we, we also are now getting semi-monthly detailed reports of where the FCMs are investing their customer funds. To date, for 2013, we've received about 1,500 of those, which also have to be reviewed immediately. Um, we also have a rule in place now that if an FCM is going to decrease their excess uh, segregated funds in any of the categories, so when I say segregated, I mean trading U.S., trading foreign, or trading cleared swaps, um, and if that excess decreases by 25 percent on any given day, they must notify their DSRO, and it must be approved by a senior executive at the firm. Um, and so for 2013, we have received approximately 80 of those notice notifications. This is something that we will look at when we get the daily reports for, from firms. So if a firm does not report that to us on the day that it happens, they will get a call from uh, our management team and there's potential disciplinary action if they don't notify us. So the the firms have been keeping on top of that. We've also begun, uh, about a year ago we started using um, confirmation.com which allowed us to get uh, direct confirmations from banks of balances that they were holding um, and we could use that then on our um, regulatory examinations. But besides that and one thing that we're probably even more excited about, we've, we, meaning NFA and CME, have engaged um, an outside vendor called Affometrics 360, and they actually aggregate balances for us at banks, all cash and uh, securities held be on behalf of customers, um, and they report that to us for every single account at every one of our FCMs every day. And we use that as a measure against what the firms are reporting to make sure that they are in line and we know the funds are there. Uh, so we have been using that. Now, right now, that's just with banks. We are in phase two uh, right now, programming, uh, that will also get those balances from carrying brokers and clearing organizations. And we hope to have that up and running still this year. Um, the carrying brokers have to be in by September. Um, also, FIA, um, NFA, the uh, Institute for Financial Markets, and CME have been engaged in a study on whether insurance is um, a potential that we could have. Uh, we've received information from several different uh, FCMs, both clear, uh, collateral and positions, and our consultants are now reviewing and analyzing all of that information. Once they get done with that, and they are in the process, and we do expect it'll take some time for them to do all the analytics, but once they do that, then we'll go out for quotes on how much insurance will cost. So that's in process, and I know that that's been something that a lot of people have been asking about the potential for that. And then um, finally, from CME's perspective, we put together a, what we called the Farmer Fund, which was uh, a fund we put together to be able to pay customers back, perhaps on a more timely basis than they would get through the whole bankruptcy um, situation if there was a shortage in the customer funds that were being held. Uh, we used it for PFG and paid out approximately $2 million, a little bit more than that, to their customers. So that's all been paid out as, as of this point. Um, one other thing I should say, we, we do regulatory examinations on our firms, um, and if you're an FCM, you know that. Um, every I don't, 9 to 15 months. But one other thing we are now doing, the, and I should also point out, those are done on a surprise basis, so the firms are not supposed to know when we are coming in, we just show up. Um, but now we're also going in intramonth just to look at the customer balances to make sure that what they're doing during the month is also in compliance with all the regulations. Um, and so far to date, we have not had any 
noted any problems with those. But we go an inch a month, again, completely surprise basis, and we tie out where the balances are. We can use the alpha metrics um, balances that we get on a daily basis to make sure that the funds are where they're supposed to be. And again, we haven't had any significant problems noted at all with any of those reviews. Um, I don't know if you want me to go into any more detail on, on any of that. Why don't we go on to the other two presentations and then we can come back for questions or discussion. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ann. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, where we are uh, with our customer protection rule set. Um, as you know, our mission is to help ensure the integrity of the futures and swaps market, and as part of that, uh, we must do everything we can to protect customer customers and their funds. And as Ann mentioned in the aftermath of the uh, FCM crises um, we saw in late 2011, 2012, uh, we saw weaknesses that needed to be dealt with. Um, and uh, we reached out broadly uh, on ways to enhance customer protections. We had three roundtables. We had multiple consultations with the SROs, many uh, industry participants from the F FIA, CME, um, NFA, uh, the FCMs, the buy side customers, as well as many discussions with fellow regulators, uh, the accounting and auditing industry, um, and we've considered comments um, on many, many comment letters, over 125 comment letters. Um, and in fact, before we came out with our proposed rule set, which I'll talk to you about a little bit, um, we had already um, adopted some important improvements uh, to protect customer funds. I'll just quickly tick through those. Um, we had completed amendments to Rule 125 regarding the investment in funds uh, to prevent the use of customer funds for in-house lending through repurchase agreements. Um, we'd required clearinghouses to collect margin on a gross basis um, so that FCMs and would not be offsetting one customer's collateral against another and then sending only the net to the clearinghouse. Uh, we'd adopted the so-called LSOC rule for swaps to help ensure customer money was being protected individually all the way to the clearinghouse. Um, we'd adopted customer protection enhancements uh, for designated contract markets, uh, basically codifying staff guidance on minimum requirements for SROs. Um, and then, um, as, uh, as Ann mentioned, in July 2012, the CFTC approved the National Futures Association's proposal uh, that stemmed from a coordinated effort, as Ann mentioned, uh, with the CFTC, the SROs, other financial regulators, and market participants to address some of the issues raised in MF Global. Um, and then we proposed the rule set in November 14, uh, 2012. Now, because the customer protection rule set, and Ann mentioned it, so I'm going to just tick through it very quickly, but just it's in the rule set, um, and uh, it's there so that we can directly enforce those rules. Let me just quickly uh, click through some of those uh, requirements. The first one is fixing Part 30 requiring that sufficient funds were held in the Part 30 accounts um, to meet the FCM's total obligations to customers um, under the net liquidating equity method um, and, and no longer holding just what was needed uh, for margin offshore with the rest being subject to risk. Um, maintaining written policies and procedures gar governing the maintenance of excess funds, as Anne just described, um, and, and then also making the additional reports available, the daily computations of, of SAG and secured. Um, and so forth. Um, but our, our rule package then goes on, and let me tick through some of those for you as well. Um, as mentioned, the daily information for, uh, for uh, bank and custodial accounts is very, very important. The proposed rule set um, included, we wanted to get direct access, which came out before Alpha Metrics was out. So we, we support alpha metric, the aggregator method. Um, we do need, and we're continuing to, uh, staff is continuing to recommend that we have, um, in times of crisis when data is not being pushed to us, that we have some kind of mechanism to allow us to have direct electronic access to bank and cust custodial account information in times of crisis to be able to turn it on at that point. Um, we think in also uh, increasing disclosure to customers regarding the risks associated with futures trading um, and also uh, requiring FCMs to provide current and potential customers with specific information, firm-specific information about the institution. We think um, 
greater enhanced controls at FCMs regarding how customer accounts are handled is important. Um, and that's included in the proposed rule set. We have standards, uh, uh, we have requirements regarding standards for SRO examinations and the annual certification, um, the annual uh, certified financial statement audits, uh, including raising the minimum standards for independent public accountants. Um, we want, um, and we proposed uh, uh, additional um, filings that would give us an, uh, an effective early warning system to allow us to get ahead of problems, to try to see around the corner where possible, uh, more than we had done. Kevin frequently discusses it as sort of, in the past, we'd been driving with a look in the rearview mirror, and we're trying to look forward uh, more. And then seventh, uh, we had ins uh, instituted a liquidity requirement for FCMs, or proposed to do so, um, and to better detect FCMs that become distressed and may put customer funds at risk. Um, all of these points, of course, were are about ensuring customers having cust uh, ensuring that customers can have confidence that the funds they post as margin or collateral are fully segregated and protected. Um, the comment period on the proposed rule set closed on February 15th of this year. We've continued to take comments. Um, there's a number of you in the room we've met uh, with recently. We've now prepared a comment summary um, with proposals um, on the final rules, which are now with commissioners, and we're working uh, together again with these additional comments, with staff of the commissioners and so on, to finalize a draft pens down rule package for commission consideration. Um, so in general, we, we still think that the, the basic direction, and I'm loath to talk too much about nits about where we are, you know, changing some things because it's part of the rulemaking process, but in general, we still think basically fix part 30, require more effective risk management, uh, require the delivery of more forward-looking information to allow us to get ahead of issues. Um, help assure better examinations by outside CPAs, SROs, and ourselves, frankly. Um, provide more information and disclosure for customers um, and implement some changes around capital and liquidity. So that's that in a nutshell. We're going to turn it to you and try to get your input and reaction to those things, but uh, first Kevin's going to say some words about the exam process. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Gary. Yes, so I thought I'd just spend a second on talking about the oversight process and how we put the pieces together. So when we, I look at oversight, there's three legs to the stool. The first is the CPA, the person who's coming in every year doing an annual audit of the intermediary. The purpose of that CPA is really twofold. One, to provide us with a level of comfort that the the financials that we get on a daily and monthly basis, we have an element of, of reliance on those because the CPA has gone through and they've looked at the controls, they looked at the process and the procedures that the firms use in preparing their financials. Um, the other element that's critical from the CPA is what we call the material inadequacy letter. So the CPA is charged with providing an opinion on the financial uh, and regulatory reporting controls. So it's just reporting, it's not operating controls, it's not risk, but it's just for financial and regulatory reporting. But that also provides us with a level of comfort that during the year, um, we have a, an element of, of relying on the CPAs uh, when we get the monthly, monthly numbers. Um, I will say, though, that as we discover errors, let's say we're in the month of June, we get their financials and we find out there was a material error, uh, we will go back to the year end and find out whether the CPA identified that error. And if not, we'll challenge the CPA and say, gee, why, why did you not pick up this error? So we're trying to uh, use that as an important leg in our oversight function. Uh, the second leg is the DSROs themselves and with the CME and the NFA as the two primary ones. Uh, they, as Ann mentioned, perform a risk-based internal controls review every nine to 15 months of the firms. Um, and, you know, they're in there and get into the detail on the firms themselves. Uh, as Dan Ann also mentioned, they receive the daily and the monthly uh, filings as well that they review, as well as the notices coming in. Um, and then, of course, in the event of crisis, we'll coordinate with Ann, uh, the CME, the NFA, on any particular issue, whether that's business continuity in Hurricane Sandy or a firm-related issue. From the CFTC perspective, so the third leg to the stool, um, I, you know, there we have uh, obviously less staff, um, not as much as I would like, but um, that's 
the, the cards I've dealt. Uh, so, but our focus is a couple of fold. One, oversight of the DSROs, making sure the CME and the NFA are doing what uh, has been asked of them and they're, they're doing it uh, appropriately. Um, we also perform what we call four cause exams. So if we see a firm is having particular problems, they're filing, filing a lot of notices or a lot of amended financial statements that may indicate a control problem, we'll go in and look very specifically. So, so a very targeted approach at the particular problem. Um, our scope is very narrow uh, because uh, we just don't have the staffing to do full scope exams, and that's you know, the role of the CME and the NFA. Uh, so we'll go in on a four-cause basis. We'll also do horizontal or sweep-type examinations. Um, and by that, uh, we've done a few of them so far, one on liquidity, where we go out to the firms and look at their liquidity. What are their sources of liquidity? Do we think they're adequate? Are they, do they have enough committed lines? Um, you know, does the firm have the proper governance over their asset liability management process to ensure that if there is a liquidity uh, problem, you've got the right folks looking at it, they've got the right uh, banking relationships and, and committed lines or uncommitted lines to help shore up their capital and their excess, because there's basically three levels. You have the excess customer protection, the excess customer reserve, the residual interest. You have the excess net capital. So those two are very effective at providing an element of liquidity. But on top of that, there's the third piece, and that's just banking liquidity, making sure, because sometimes just because you have excess net capital doesn't mean that's liquid net capital. So we like to see what liquidity do they have in the market. So if there is some uh, time when there's a large customer, big margin call uh, that the customer can't make, a deficit in the account, the firm has the ability to, to get, uh, have the cash to cover that call. Um, so, you know, the others that we've looked at, uh, we looked at, looking at anti-money laundering processes, their business continuity process, and that was in the wake of uh, Hurricane Sandy. We did a joint review with the SEC um, and FINRA. Uh, and then uh, targeted residual is another one that we've looked at recently. Um, and then just finally, uh, we also do the daily monitoring, uh, the monthly monitoring of the financials as they come in. They go through our system, and we do regression analysis, trend analysis, and comparative analysis on the financials to see if there's anything that pops out from that standpoint. So that's sort of the, the oversight function in, in a nutshell. Okay, Gary? No, thank you very much. Um, why don't we turn it over? The real function here, of course, is to tell you a little bit about what we're doing, but to get your reactions to and your advice um, about what we're doing. So we'll just turn it over and open to uh, comments, please. Yeah, I, I would say that's really critical because what we're trying to do is get in front of commissioners a final document. We, we use this term in, in um, the CFTC folklore, pens down, <laughs> meaning the staff has put their pens down and then commissioners are weighing in. But that's a little misleading because commissioners weigh in all the time before the staff <laughs> gets the pens down. But this input, it comes at a really critical time because Gary and his team are trying to get something to the commissioners in the next, you know, few weeks to six weeks. Mr. Chairman, will the um, comments here be included in the comment file for the rule? I think they, they most definitely need to be. Okay. And, you know, we have a whole transcript, so we can just put the whole transcript of this section into the administrative procedures record. I, would, I wanted to add something, too, because Kevin, in his presentation, mentioned this. Um, and it, this came up earlier in the week when Commissioner Malley and I were up in, up in the House. Uh, Kevin mentioned the importance of doing examinations of FCMs. Um, those examinations require people. And so I wanted to make this point to this group because I think this group uh, might be uh, uniquely positioned to help the agency on this front. Uh, after MF Global, after Peregrine, it's fair to say none of us want to have to go through that again. And one of the best ways to ensure against that, in addition to some of these policy changes, are routine, substantive, deep examinations of FCMs. And in order to do that, we need personnel. We need staff to do that. Um, this agency is underfunded. We have more responsibilities now than we did three years ago, and we need the staff to do the job. We need the staff to make sure something like MF Global, something like Peregrine doesn't happen again. None of us want to see confidence in the markets we oversee shaken in the way it was, 
And one of the easiest ways we can do that is to advocate to the Congress to ensure that we have sufficient resources here. I, I, I just don't, I can't, I can't uh, say how important that is, uh, or I can't overstate it rather. And I, as I said, I think this group here is probably uniquely positioned to help us on that front. Uh, we're, the, the rules are essentially final, finalized, as, as uh, Chairman Gensler said. We're 90 percent done. We're now in the next phase of this, which is implementation. Not only do we need to do examinations, we need to get questions uh, to folks, or answers to questions, rather, when, when uh, people bring issues to us, uh, which is all the more reason for um, additional resources, additional staff and personnel here that can provide those answers to questions and, and undertake these examinations that are going to be very, very important. Who would like to start off the discussion? Questions or responses? Yes. So I appreciate uh, everything that you folks are working on on, on uh, this topic, but the totality of this and how it all fits together is a little bit beyond what I can comprehend. And I was curious, that is there a way we could do a bit of a case study and maybe use MF Global and Peregrine and go back and, and show how these changes that you have made would have created a red flag or an alert that would have identified the issue sooner, and then what you would have done to alert those that had accounts with those two entities to be able to um, transition something that didn't create an, another issue. Any, we, any opportunity for that? We, we can't really use Peregrine or MF Global until it's sufficiently history and it, everything's public. So I don't think we should speak to them. But it, the concept, the principle that you're talking about, um, our rules uh, till now have largely, the principles are right. Um, and um, we were talking about this yesterday, rules that say, you know, you will not commingle customer funds. You will not use customer funds Im improperly. But that's kind of like, um, in a way, that's kind of like a speed limit that says you won't pe go faster than X miles an hour. And if you don't have cops there to catch people, you're not going to have sufficient deterrence. If you don't have sufficient risk management, you can't self-police a separation of duties and things that will mitigate the risk that people will violate things or act out of conflicts of interest. So, and if you have our orientation, if the only things you deal with are violations and you look at them after they've occurred and they're either big enough to send to enforcement or you fix them and move on, then you haven't dealt with trends and problems and, and so on. So if you look at this, the main core idea of SEG and its importance is there, and it's how to minimize, how to mitigate the risk to SEG. And one thing we did learn is that company risk, when people get in, you know, that failing to have sufficient internal um, review or, or uh, risk management. Um, can be an issue, and also operating company risk can put customer funds at risk. And so if you look at these different proposals around that, they're trying to bolster the SEG system. So I know there are people, we've talked about alternative SEG systems that are being looked at by the industry. We support that consideration, whether it's insurance, whether it's, you know, some kind of perfect SEG or alternative SEG system. Those all have gating and timing issues to it. So when we have the system we have right now, um, and the industry's proposed this as well about the need to increase risk management, the ma management of risk. So uh, that's how I would say if you look at the orientation, it's like um, greater risk management to help mitigate uh, human problem, you know, mis mis pro mis misfeasance or malfeasance. Allow us to do a better job. Don't just look in the window at something that's gone wrong. Try to look at what's going on. Risk. Uh, so we need for more forward-looking information make sure that our examination and oversight has got that orientation to it as well. Make sure we're keeping up with the rest of the world. Uh, FINRA and the SEC went to a more risk-based orientation six, seven years ago. We've lagged. How do we catch up with that? How do we stay current with other best practices? We tried to address all of those sorts of things in this rule set. And that's kind of an organizing principle around the different Ke pieces Kevin of and it. Gary, I'm going to answer the question directly. Ed Peregrine. Lots of bad actor, you know, basically doctoring books and everything like that. That's well uh, out there. The system of the self-regulatory organizations 
and the CFTC being able to directly, through modern technology means, see what's in the bank account, see what's in the custodial account, and have a confirmation, uh, an online affirmative confirmation of those accounts, is something that I think uh, directly addresses those, par not all of the Peregrine issues, but directly addresses, and I think what already, and Anne went through some of this, but already the NFA and CME and others have started to use, I'm trying to remember the, what's the outside service? Alpha metrics. Alpha metrics to, to have those direct electronic views daily into the, uh, the cash and custodial accounts. Um, uh, I'm not participating in, in the specific matters around MF Global, but more generically about the public policy issues, ensuring that a futures commission merchant keeps its books and records in a stronger way and nobody can pull out more than 25 percent of what's called the excess without a CEO signature or senior officer signature, uh, you know, I think addresses some of that. But that's my short version of, I think, what your question was. Thank you. But so, so, so if you do find an issue, then what do you do? So do you alert the account holders of the FCM that there may be an issue? So what, what, because that could create some sort of a dysfunctional system too. Well, Kevin could uh, uh, briefly tell you, but if some futures commission merchant is using customer money at any point in a day, you know, intraday, end of day, it doesn't matter, any point in a day, that's a violation. And that's when Kevin and Gary and sometimes the full commission, I mean, we're alerted to these things as well. And it becomes a very intense discussion with the future commission merchant. I, I guess that's, I'd like to leave it there maybe. But. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think very intense is probably an understatement. Um, yes, and, but whenever there are any issues that we see, whether they're at the CFTC, at the SEC, FINRA, or any other international regulator that we've become aware of, we always take a retrospective look and do a postmortem and say, okay, could this happen with our registrants? Is there something we should change either in our internal examination process or should we send out what we call Dear FCM letters that go out to the FCMs and say, by the way, we saw this and just want to give you a heads up on it. And I would just like to add that as an SRO, we have um, an assortment of emergency actions that we can take. In a situation where an FCM was not holding the customer funds that they told us they had, uh, we would be in there immediately and looking to transfer customers and, and find out where did that money go. Mr. Chairman. Um, maybe we could answer, I think you asked a, a very good question about what, when does the customer know? When will the customer notify if, if something's gone wrong with his account? How will how will we address that? How does we? I think we know how using the SRO enhanced um, oversight responsibilities, but specifically, how will we interface with the customer uh, on these individual things under the new customer protection proposed customer protection rules? Okay, now my answer may be too technical, and you'll have to jump back in. Um, we have struggled with some of the, we get additional information, and what do we do when we have early warning issues? I mean, if it's one thing we're talking about, SEG's been violated, but, you know, early warning on, cap, on capital or something like that, or other stress problems that come up, there is a real tension between um, having the uh, future, inf having the inform forward-looking information as a regulatory tool, and then accelerating the problem by making it public. So there is a, we have, we have provided that there should be more fulsome disclosure to uh, customers about the markets and uh, futures trading and so on and so forth and firm specific disclosure but at some point the information the real-time information about problems at the FCM um, start to create um, if you disseminate that uh, information it accelerates the problem and you can't help resolve it so that there's a real issue there. We've struggled with that all the time. Um, there have been situations we've been stuck in when we couldn't provide information we would have liked to, and we had, then, then we turned to uh, CME, for instance, with their powers to help protect, maybe stop allowing new people to come in, dealing with certain accounts, things like that. So it's a little bit of a balancing when things get really tough. 
Does that help or hurt? <laughs> I appreciate that. That's helpful. Thank you. Gary, could you also mention maybe some of the Know Your FCM changes we made a year over a year ago that might help people understand who they're commingled with, what, what they've been set up with in terms of, uh, I think those were done at least a year ago, if not longer, it at least help customers understand what, where they're putting their money and who they're investing with in an FCM? Yeah, but those are still proposed. Right. All right. Why don't you go ahead? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yes, we got uh, – there are a few things that we were able to get out very quickly. Uh, information, financial information on the uh, on the firms themselves, so the segregation amounts, uh, excess Sorry. amounts, net capital, um, uh, where funds are invested. Then information um, through the NFA, they were able to get that out very quickly on their website, and it's right there for all – um, investors to look at, anyone do, wanting to do due diligence on their FCM can look at it and get a lot of uh, useful financial data. Uh, it's on a monthly basis right now where the, the information is updated, uh, but that is all there as well. So uh, that, that was, I think, very, very helps to get out quickly. So we've looked at the uh, customer protection rules, and one thing I think along these lines that we would advocate is that we, we support all the information that you propose to require FCMs to disclose to you, but we think that there should be some more information disclosed to customers. And so some of those would be schedules for the segregation amounts, the secured amount and cleared swaps, cleared swaps and customer uh, seg amount for the customer seg amounts, as well as the summary balance sheets and some of the uh, the income statements monthly. So that we think that that would be very helpful information to provide to customers. And so that way customers, th you know, along, you know, all the while can kind of make their own assessments too. I guess as a small producer uh, that who uses uh, Chicago Board of Trade and then the CME for the last 30 years, I've never had a problem. I was not involved in MF Global or any of those, so I've been very fortunate. But I use those products for risk management. And when we talk about margin call and things like that, and I've read some things in, in I don't know if they're up to date what I'm seeing or not, but if you increase um, the amount of money that I have to place on margin, um, right now, I mean, I have three business days, I think, to uh, send money in, and that, that works for me. Um, you make that any tighter, and at some point in time, I'll probably quit using the exchange. I just can't stay on top of it that much as a producer. As a small businessman, you might say, we just, it's too much of a requirement. And on top of that, if I see that correctly, I mean, it would put more of money, more money of mine at risk to an MF Global because I'd have more margin money there. So it just it puts me at, at higher risk. Um, as far as insurance, I guess um, that would all be nice if they could buy insurance, but they're going to pass that cost on to me too. So I, I guess I don't see a use for it. Uh, I wish, I guess the only thing I can see from the MF Global bankruptcy that I think could be done differently is if, if my funds were put at the top of the list for bankruptcy. <laughs> but otherwise, when you have bad actors that break the law, I think they're going to continue to say, look for ways around your regulations and your rules, and I, it's unfortunate. But So I expect it to still happen. So I sweep my fund regularly now, which I don't like to do. I used to keep quite a bit of money there, so we didn't have to send money back and forth. But now uh, it's, it's different. So I mean, some of that trust is gone. But for you to send information for my FCM, that's of no use to me whatsoever. I, I'm not sophisticated enough to analyze that data. I, I hope I know my FCM, but it does me no good. Understood. The, the margin deficit residual interest issue is what you were talking about is um, a very uh, important question and one that we're looking at inter internally uh, very carefully. Uh, the NGFA uh, represents um, over a thousand member companies encompassing um, all aspects of the agribusiness in the USA. Uh, we've been on record already, um, si similar to what you were saying. Um, we, first, we appreciate the effort that you guys made into some of the insurance funds, and we were um, anxiously awaiting to see, see your results on cost. Um, 
we do take issues with um, two things that we feel could greatly increase um, customer risks. Uh, first was the timing of when an FCM takes a capital charge. Um, we've urged, um, urged you to stay at the three-day window, again, similar. Uh, and also the concept of uh, the residual interest where the FCM can kind of top up the account until the margin call is, uh, is received. Um, we feel if we change that, uh, there, there's a, a strong likelihood that we see FCMs requiring pre-funding of the margining accounts um, to exactly your same point. Now, now if I'm an elevator uh, and I have $2 million on deposit with my FCM, I have to have an additional million dollars there so there's more money potentially at risk in case someone does get around the regulations again and we have a situation similar to an MF Global. Could I ask a follow-up uh, 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 both of the last commenters? One of the challenges we have is the law itself. This is a law that's been in place for some time that you're, and I'm going to, I'm not a lawyer but I'll, I'll paraphrase as I understand it, that thou shall not <laughs> use one customer's money to secure or guarantee another customer's position or deficit, roughly speaking. <laughs> um, and so the, what we put out in this proposal was a rule that basically said that. The Futures Commission merchants highlighted to us, well, actually, there's been a practice uh, for some time, maybe years, whereby if you had a deficit, if, as you said, uh, is your first name, what's it? MJ. MJ, okay. As MJ said, that you'd like to still have three days. So if, if they made a call on you on a Tuesday because you were in deficit, you want to uh, Wednesday, Thursday, maybe Friday, three days or, or Thursday. But what the Futures Commission merchants are doing is during those three days, is possibly using somebody else's money to secure your deficit. Now, the Futures Commission merchant itself might have enough of their own money, and it's totally appropriate that they would put some of their capital, their money, in to secure your deficit. What we did in this proposed rule is, what if the Futures Commission merchant isn't putting their money in to secure your deficit? but they're using uh, who wants to volunteer their money to be used for MJ. Can I see by a show of hands who wants their surplus to be used for MJ's deficit? I haven't seen any raised well, hands. That's the, the right challenge that we have. Say. That's the challenge that we have. Ed, you want your money to be used for at, at, MJ's at deficit? At the right interest rate, I may take that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But that's, that's, that's I'm, I'm trying to frame this public policy and legal issue uh, and, 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 and what we are, and, and this, this is the challenge that we have. And I don't know what the right answer is, but MJ's got a deficit. He wants three days because... And, and I'm sorry, I don't remember the gentleman name who was so articulate. Kurt. Kurt. Uh, Kurt says, I'm a small uh, producer and, and businessman, and, and, and I don't have the books to sort of keep up with this. That all sounded, I mean, I grew up, my dad had a small business with 30, 35 employees, and if, you know, he didn't make payroll on Friday, he shut down. <laughs> and uh, my mom was the bookkeeper. Um, so uh, I identify with what Kurt said then there's this issue, does, does Kurt's deficit or MJ's deficit get funded by Ed? I think that's a good question. Oh. Sorry for that. Um, we, we have no intention of wanting one for the other. As you mentioned, may fund it with another customers as opposed to may put up their own capital for it as well. Um, many FCMs are already down to um, one day, so where that money is trued up the next day. Um, Again, we, we would support the idea that there's no one customer's funds not used for another customer's deficit as well. Um, the concern we have is, is more oh, the dollars that I need to margin my account, is that going to increase dramatically and therefore perhaps put more money at risk uh, in a case of a default? David. Yeah, it, the, the question. I might almost be ready to raise my hand and say, customer to customer, 
if, if it's at some level of, again, we're not talking deficits necessarily, we're talking undermargined. I have a much bigger problem with the FCM using my excess funds for their internal investments that are not subject to margining rules. That was the creation of an MF Global, not M the inner transfer among customer segregated accounts. So I think we need to make sure we understand, in some regards, this movement to the one day versus the industry practice, if you will, particularly with small customer accounts. I've been on both sides of having reportable positions and been relatively a small customer. I was, my FCM had me on a much tighter leash when I was on reportable positions than when I was trading one contract of corn or two contracts of corn. And the ability for me to use, to satisfy it by bringing in a check the next morning, which probably was not going to clear in the FCM's account for two days, I don't, need, I don't really want that to go away, as opposed to me having to come off the tractor, figure out how to get a wire transfer for a $200 margin call. So I think there's a difference between when I was on a call with reportable positions as opposed to on a call that might be a $100 call, a $200 call, and the ability of an FCM to manage that internally. And, and the movement of segregated funds at the margin possible, you know, being a net margining was not the was not the result that resulted in either Peregrine or MF Global. And let's make sure we're not causing problems for functionality, particularly in the ag community, to solve, and, and none of this would have solved Peregrine or MF Global. And I think that's the concern that's being raised is we're applying a bandage to the wrong sore. You know, we're putting something on and we're trying to fix something that wasn't the problem. It wasn't the causality. And I, I understand there may be issues with law that have to be clearly addressed by, by the commission. But on the other hand, let's make sure we're not creating problems at the farm level, at the elevator level, et cetera, that in fact makes us riskier in the name of consumer protection customer protection, we make us all riskier. And, and that, I think, is the concern that has been raised by Grain and Feed, been raised by American Farm Bureau, and I think a number of other institutions that represent the farmer interests. I'd like to add just a few comments and maybe staff can elaborate or, or maybe uh, Commissioner Weijin, you mentioned earlier this is under review and I know there's been a lot of testimony on this and, I, and I've made some comments as well. I think part of our discussion here is how you interpret the new rules or the laws. We're not talking so much uh, deficits, we're talking potential margin calls. I, I think there's a difference. Uh, I mean, when nobody's asking anybody to cover someone else's deficit, the way the rules are written or proposed is as an FCM, you're going to have to make sure your customer has enough money to meet a potential margin call, which means look at the market right now. If uh, you got a short position on in corn and it's up 30 cents, do you have that additional money there? The way the rules are written today, I'm seeing it's going to be we're going to ask the customer to basically double fund their margin call. You're going to have the initial margin call and you're going to have money in your account to fund a one day's move. That's the, the, the fallout or what it's, it's looking like at this point. So I'd be curious if staff or, or one of the commissioners would like to comment on how you're looking at uh, handling those uh, revised uh, interpretations or rules. You know, I see Bob Wasserman and Ananda here as well. I don't know if either of you wanted to. Uh, the, the, Ananda is the head of our Division of Clearing and Risk. and. Um, uh, I, I don't mean to take it away from you, Gary, but uh, since he's maybe. Can I add something just before you start? And, and Scott is right. It's not deficits, meaning a negative account balance. That's already covered by the regulations today. Firms have to put their own money in to cover those today. It is the margin call issue that we're talking about. That's the change. <clears throat> What's your name, sir? Scott. Scott. All right. Scott and Kirk. 
you bought with the same FCM. You be closer to the mic. Okay, you bought the same FCM, and you both put on positions that require a margin of hundred dollars each. Okay, and your FCM, and that's the margin of the CME, two hundred bucks. Right? So the FCM gives your hundred dollars and cuts hundred dollars to the CME. Next day, your margin requirement drops to $80. Cut's margin requirement goes up to $120. As far as the CME is concerned, it's still $200. Right? But what we're saying is that the FCM cannot use your $20 to fund his margin call. That's all we're saying. So would you like that? I'm not disagreeing with that. Yeah. The way it's proposed today is you don't even have the next day to collect the $200 as an FCM from him to get to the CME. Right, but You're saying it's real time right now. Right, but then the issue is, the issue, and maybe this is something, you know, the staff can, can clarify. The issue is when the CME makes the margin call, and that's the point of time where the clearing member has to pony up, right? So at the time in which the obligation of, this, of, of the FCM arises to meet margin requirements, that's the time at which the FCM has to make sure that it is not using one customer's funds to margin right. secure guarantee another customer's uh, obligation. Now, but, but keep in mind, too, that if Scott's margin goes down to 80, mm -hmm. he can take that 20 bucks out immediately. The firm can, has to give that to him immediately, right. in which case, now they do have to put up their own money at That's the That's right. House. But, all, but, but, but what we Kirk want up. to say is it, we, don't want, we don't want a situation where the FCM uses its own funds. Well, I'm, I'll speak for staff. You know, it, it, we don't think it's right that the FCM puts its own capital into the SEG account only at a point in time when Scott wants to withdraw his $20. I mean, at all times, his money should not be used to margin secure or guarantee the obligations of another customer. That, that's, that's the point. Right? I, mean, I think the issue we're trying to balance is this. There's some very real practicalities, and you've pointed them out. There's also the fact that if the FCM goes bust, and you find out that your $20 isn't there because actually they were using it to margin Kurt's positions, and Kurt as well had a bit of a problem, you'd be very upset. And among other things, you'd be upset with, well, us. On the other hand, you're right. There are practical issues, and we don't want to put folks in a position where there needs to be double margining. So as Ananda said, the first issue is you put your position on, say, you know, Monday morning, and there's an increase in margin requirements, or let's say Kurt does, rather. Your money isn't actually getting used until the FCM moves money upstream, say, to the CMA. So it's not a immediate matter. In other words, he has to be in the right place at all times. Bob, can I ask a question? Sure. You, you raised the, the, the point in bankruptcy. We've got this pro rata distribution rule well outside of our ability to fix it in a rulemaking. So when it goes to bankruptcy, it doesn't matter. Everybody's money freezes. It doesn't matter whether he's 20 up or 20 down. Everybody, If there's a hole, everybody is frozen, and that hole is distributed evenly. So it doesn't – he can be mad, but the bankruptcy code is the problem. It, how, how do you resolve a hole in bankruptcy under pro rata distribution? So the purpose of the – our, there's two levels. Unless it takes three years like it's taken in MF Global. Well, again, you know, I will note in MF Global, most of the money did go out in a much shorter period of time, albeit it is only now that we're getting towards the very good result of hopefully getting close on 100 percent. That said, MF Global is an example of where the rules were not followed, and at a certain level, if the rules are not followed, there's problems there. If the rules are followed, and the question is what the rules are, and we try to make sure that they are followed, we want to make sure that if the rules are followed and someone loses money, because that does happen. Can we come back to the specific example? So sure. how does this daily margin true-up rule protect you in a, 
in a pro rata distribution under bankruptcy if there's a hole in somebody's account. Forgive me, but the idea is that this is ensuring, this is to reduce the likelihood of that hole occurring in the first place. Mm -hmm. In other words, if um, Kurt has a margin requirement of 120, we want to make sure that there's 120 of Kurt's money there to meet that margin requirement so that if Kurt defaults when there is a margin, when there's an actual loss, there's enough money there. Okay, but in the case of a default, somebody defaults, somebody has a hole, blows himself up, blows, blows himself up. How does, how does this rule, would this rule change anything about the pro rata distribution in bankruptcy? This rule is not intended to change the pro rata okay. distribution in bankruptcy. Can, can, can I use the example, and, and, and uh, the advisory committee is seeing us deliberate with our staff, but, so, <laughs> uh, but Kurt has a $120 now margin requirement right. under the example, but right. he only has $100 right. in. Right. And uh, Scott has a hundred dollars in, but no, no longer he he wants you know he might have wanted his twenty dollars back, but before Scott got his twenty dollars back, either the FCM goes bankrupt or sorry Kurt Kurt goes <laughs> bankrupt. I, I didn't, but just as an example. Um, back to Commissioner Malia's question, will. Will Scott get his hundred dollars or not? I mean, I know that on Tuesday, twenty of Scott's dollars are being used to margin Kurt. Kurt only put a hundred in. Now Kurt goes belly up. Is is what what happens? I, I don't know the answer. So this the, is not a setup. I'm if, trying to no, understand. If, and if these are the only, let's assume for the moment these are the only two customers. So if Kurt loses a hundred and twenty dollars. Because let's say, you know, indeed maybe he, Kurt loses $120. The margin being a measure of. Actually, you know, let's answer the question. If Kurt goes bankrupt, the FCM's fine, then, then Ed's fine. Uh, he can go away if he wants, but, you know, there's no FCM insolvency, right? So if Kurt goes, and I hope you don't go bankrupt, but, you know, let, let's see. <laughs> the issue is what happens if on that same day the FCM is insolvent because of Kurt's inability to fund the margin. Right? That, that's the specific question, right? So the issue then is whether there is a shortfall in segregation, right? Being, uh, short, shortfall in meaning, if all of the customers who have credit balances or equity show up and say, give me my money back, does the FCM have enough money to give it back? Because Kurt cannot get more than what he's entitled to. Right. So I think what will happen is that there will be an attempt, and you know, and correct me if I'm wrong, but an attempt to freeze out Kurt and try and move all of the positions and the money of the non-defaulting customers to the extent possible. And if, and if the loss is big enough, won't it be pro-ratted? Right. Pro right. Yeah. Like if, if, there is, if, there's, if the loss is big enough and there is a shortfall in segregation as a whole, then it, the and, and, and there's a bankruptcy filing, then the pro rata distribution rules, you know, come into effect. But the objective of this rule is to make sure, one, to be faithful to the statute. We have about five minutes left on the topic. Let me throw it back to the committee and see if, David, you have a comment you'd like to make? Again, it, it, it strikes me as part of the conversation. We're trying to solve a bankruptcy problem with a CFTC ruling. It, with regard to the pro rata distributions and those, we are still talking margin. We're not talking deficit. The account is not deficit. The account may be under margined, and in an under margined, that doesn't mean there isn't sufficient if the position is liquidated for everyone to be made whole. Because you're still on a margin position. It is a totally different thing if we're talking using my funds to cover somebody's deficit position. Then I am at risk because there is not sufficient funds in the segregated accounts to make everyone whole. But if it is simply a margin position that is underfunded for a very short period of transactional time, I'm not at risk. I only become at risk is if the other person goes deficit. 
not if they're under margin. And I think we're mistaking the ability to do transactional lubricity, I'll call it, to make the system work with markets that are moving constantly during the day. And they, we hit a settlement point at one time, and yes, I can tell you, I've been both a broker, I've been on, like I said, been on multiple sides of this. I, if, if it's a significant risk, I'm in contact with them, or they're in contact with me. If it is that it's this minor piece, and I know the customer, oh, send me the check tomorrow. But I'm not putting someone else at risk. Now, if my account goes deficit because I got $5,000 in there and the market moves $10,000 against me, that's a whole different situation as if my account went deficit. I think we really are trying to solve something that's a bankruptcy issue with a rule that really takes and puts sand in the gears of functionality. And I think we need to be very, very careful about doing d d uh, It's David, right? Yeah, I, I assure you, we're trying to be very, very careful. I think that there's two issues. One is the law, the thou shall not use secure guarantee, you know, with one customer's money, other people. So that's that's um, this intraday or intra three day. Uh, what was the word you used? Loop. I used uh, transactional lubricity. Lubricity. <laughs> I'll look it up later, uh, um, but it sounds good. Um, uh, that transactional lubricity uh, intraday or for three days, is that consistent or conflicting that thou shall not use secure customer money, et cetera? That's the legal question. I'm not a lawyer, but that's, that's an important piece. But I do think that there is some risk, even if it's using somebody's margin, because if, if the music stops and the FCM goes default and Kurt's not there, sorry, Kurt, um, and in liquidating the position, CME has to move his position or liquidate the position, they needed the 120. Uh, if they liquidated and they only needed five bucks, then that's all right. But the risk would probably come if they had to liquidate it and his, his initial margin wasn't enough. So I'm just saying there is, there is some risk. How you measure that, I'm not saying, but there is some risk, um, I think. But so it's a legal question, and then there is some risk. And I do share, it's not what Peregrine and the others were about, but that's... Can, can I ask Bob and Ananda, maybe, so we don't avoid commissioner discussion here, but... Um, if it's the law, how have we not interpreted it this way previously? What, were, what, what was our standard before? I think we, uh, staff, I'll speak for staff, assumed that people knew what the law was and were complying with the law the way that the law said they had to comply. And then it was through, you know, our activities uh, as a result of these two uh, unfortunate events that we realized that people had a different view of the law. In my view, a wrong view of the law. But Ananda, I don't know that that's entirely true in that at the FCM level itself, <coughs> this is one of the things we look for on our regulatory examinations is to make sure they are following the law at the FCM. I'm not talking about what they put up at the clearinghouse. I'm talking about making sure they hold the funds they, they need to hold. And they are doing that. And they always have been doing that. That's different than what What's going on at the so house. what we're saying is, let's clarify the law. This is the law. Right? It's, 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 you know, as Chairman has said, it's, the statute is very clear. You cannot use one customer's money or funds or property to margin secure guarantee the obligations of another. So nobody's been able to make the argument, with all due respect, that what we're suggesting is not what the law says it is, right? The arguments we've heard, you know, through all the comment letters is it's going to be expensive, the earth's going to fall, so on and so forth. But nobody said, nobody's done, you know, to my view, a legal analysis saying your analysis is wrong. Right? I mean, that gentleman over there said, you know, it's the difference between deficit and, and margin, but the point is that if the example that I gave takes place, the FCM is using 
one customer's property to margin somebody else's requirement. Let me, let me just, we need to move on to the next topic. Let's have just one more comment, if you'd well, like, and then we'll. From my perspective, I mean, I guess I was always more concerned when I had excess margin there. I, I kind of knew they were using my money to do something I didn't know what, because somebody always uses it. Whether they invest it wisely or not, I was always hoping I'd get it back. But I guess my, my biggest concern as a user of the CME right now is that if I have excess margin there and my FCM goes bankrupt, why can't I get all my money back if customer accounts are segregated? Or how can we do that to protect my excess margin there? The rest of it is, is just positions that, yes, they're frozen. That, that's unfortunate, and that's taken a long time in some cases. But it puts me at risk. And, and I don't mind leaving those excess funds there if I know they're protected somehow. Thank you very much for the discussion. Scott, you want one yeah, more? Can I just one last comment? I'll keep it brief. You talked about the practicality and, and what goes on. I think one thing that needs to be considered is you got wire transfers in, wire transfers out. They don't always necessarily go in the order you want. So what is the practicality of how that works on a day's transaction, whether it's between you and your FCM or the FCM and the clearinghouse? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Ann and uh, uh, Kevin and, and Gary. Uh, we're gonna change. Mr. Chairman, can sure. I make one last comment? Okay. This is um, the last, last comment. That's that's fine. Um, make sure you wish Ann a happy birthday. It was yesterday and 25 years at CME service today. So this is how she spends her day. Okay, that was Thank a good you. comment. Yeah. We're going to change directions just a little bit and talk about renewable identification numbers, RENs. Uh, as you may know, um, maybe eight or ten weeks ago, uh, futures contracts were initiated to, tra to actually trade RENs explicitly. We have uh, two members of the panel today to talk to us about those. Um, the first one is uh, Philip Verliger, who's uh, the principal of PK Verliger, who's going to talk to us a little bit about the background of RENs. And then also the chief economist, uh, the, the interim chief economist, um, uh, here at the uh, the exchange, Scott Vix Mixon is also going to speak to us. So we'll go from there. If I'm trying to see how to get your computer to work, let me hope somebody can make this bring the slides up on the screen while I'm talking uh, because your time is brief. There we go. Um, first, uh, one, I have submitted a paper, uh, uh, which will be also on our website. Second, uh, let me just summarize it. Ethanol uh, has been used as a fuel additive uh, uh, for many years in the oil business. It has a high octane. That makes it popular with refiners, especially when the price is low, uh, because it cuts the cost of producing gasoline. Other things being equal today, refiners would blend as much uh, ethanol as they could into gasoline. Uh, as you can see from this first chart, the uh, price of ethanol, which is the black line, is below the price of uh, RBOB, which is the refining blending stock for gasoline. Might add that if you blend more ethanol, you can make a lower octane gasoline, which is lower cost to manufacture. Second point, existing infrastructure within the petroleum industry distribution limits the amount of gas, ethanol and gasoline to 10 percent. This is a uh, regulation having to do with fire hazards and the rules that are established by uh, UL laboratories. There are, you, can build, you can install separate pumps for higher uh, ethanol. They're very expensive, and so uh, companies tend not to do that. Marketers tend not to do that. Third point. Congress dictated a specific volume of ethanol that had to be blended into motor fuels when it passed the Energy Acts of 2004, more recently, the Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007. EPA implements that act. Uh, today, this year, 2000, 20 billion gallons of renewable fuels must be blended in gasoline uh, and other motor fuels. 16.5 billion of those are ethanol. Now, the projected ga uh, gasoline and diesel use is eight, 100, uh, 183 billion gallons, or that was the projection made by uh, EIA last year. That means you have to blend about 11 percent. Now, either, you know, the, the traditional way of working in Washington would be to require 
a specific number of uh, gallons or specific percentage in every gallon. Uh, EPA has in introduced tradable credits called renewable identification numbers. They are 18-digit long numbers which EPA tracks and can be traded uh, uh, like uh, pollution credits or any other. Uh, EPA has encountered significant uh, difficulties with enforcement of the law, uh, particularly as to, uh, to uh, biodiesel RINs. Several people are in jail now. Buyers who free uh, uh, of fraudulently created RINs were required to replace them. That is, EPA, if they find their fraudulent, goes to the buyer, say Valero, and says you bought it from Sam, you have to buy some more. Uh, EPA has uh, cleared some of that up now uh, with a certification program. There are six types of RINs. My focus is today is going to be uh, the D6 RIN, as EPA calls it, which is the ethanol RIN, which is what CME trades. That is what's blended in gasoline. Until, uh, if, if, if you look for a second, the table just shows the, on uh, the second column, the requirements. Uh, until this year, the prices of RINs were essentially negligible. The reason was that essentially we were well, well below the 10 percent blend rate and, co and companies were happy to move ahead uh, using, and you, they were using more ethanol than required so the price was free. But what has happened is gasoline demand has failed to keep up with the projected levels that, uh, EP, uh, that were used by Congress uh, when they passed the act. If you look at this chart, what we show is the trend in gasoline that was expected by Congress from, uh, uh, from EIA when the law was passed in uh, 2006 as compared to what has actually happened. And we are now seeing roughly a 10, 20 percent shortfall in gasoline consumption with an absolute fixed requirement for blending gasoline. Now, the decline has come because consumers finally figured out after 30 years that uh, energy prices were high and they ought to consume. And so if you look at Bureau of Economic Data on gasoline consumption, which is probably the most accurate by month, what you see is a trend line, the red line, uh, of to uh, gasoline as a percentage of total consumption. That broke in 2005, and we are now, again, about 20 percent short, and we're going further. Um, so what has happened is the price of RINs have risen dramatically. Uh, at the beginning of the year, they were zero. Last week, they were $1.40. This morning, I was informed by uh, Tom Close, the editor of Opus, they dropped to 90 cents. They have since back uh, risen back to $1.10. Uh, uh, this is a problem because Valero, one of the largest refiners, a company that I was on the board, of, a member of the board of directors uh, 20 years ago, has said it's going to spend between $600 and $800 million this year for RINs. It's not a trivial subject. And so refiners have been pushing on Congress to change the law, uh, which would reduce their obligation. Uh, all of the discussion so far has ignored, though, a E85, which is a 15 percent blend of gasoline and an 85 uh, percent blend of, ga uh, of ethanol. Well, those of you from the Midwest will be familiar with it. It has been available for years, but the price has not been attractive. Consumers have been able to, uh, could see it at the pump selling for less. In this case, on the graph, uh, this comes from the AAA, the average price of E10, which is regular gasoline, and E85, you can see it's below. But you don't get as much energy, so, and my chartists reverse the colors, the price t has tended to be uh, well above uh, the price of e E10, and uh, nobody's used it. Well. Recently, as prices of RINs have increased, uh, the uh, uh, price of E85 has been falling because E85 is essentially a tool for manufacturing RINs. You get 0.75 RIN extra, which you can sell. So you get a, if you sell, uh, if I sell uh, Mr. Uh, Friesen a, a gallon of E85, I get a dollar back from somebody else, and some marketers are passing this on. We have seen an experiment in Minnesota, and what has happened is sales have tripled. We're seeing sales in other parts of the country, and we're actually seeing now, if you look at the average price of gasoline from January, and the price of uh, the green line is E 20 percent, uh, 80 percent of E10, 
And below that, we show the energy equivalent price of E85. And it has dropped just in July to a point where it pays. And we are now seeing very large volumetric sales. If the program continues as it is, and if EPA sh does not show flexibility, uh, I think the E85, if you do the numbers, will work out and we'll see the problem, essentially the RIN problem that the oil refiners keep identifying go away. The market will clear. It will help if there is act active trade in the CME contract. When I checked their website last week, there were 70 contracts open. Now, I had I helped introduce the uh, NYMEX crude contract many years ago, so it takes a while for a new contract to work, but we have, we have yet to see uh, significant activity. There remain, however, some significant problems. Uh, the oil industry, part of the oil industry, does not like it. And we, we keep seeing, we saw this week hearings in Congress calling for repeal of the uh, Renewable Fuels Act. Uh, the, I think the consensus of Congress is that's not going to happen. The Republicans told the uh, people to uh, oil and ethanol people to go back and renegotiate it. We have seen uh, inability of EPA to uh, issue rules in a timely fashion. Now, that shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody at this agency because uh, uh, Congress quite frequently imposes regulations which are far too uh, complicated to be implemented in a timely fashion. EPA is supposed to issue the final rules for a current year on the November of the previous years. They have not, and that creates uncertainty. It makes it difficult to trade. And in fact, today's drop in the price uh, and then the rebound may have come because if you look at the timing of it from a report on Bloomberg where the, some of the renewable fuels producers said, well, maybe we'll compromise on the agreement. The basic facts, though, are that this, the program is basically sound. It's going to take some adjustment, but their flexibility is there. It's just being ignored. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Scott. Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, I'll try to multitask for a second and bring up my presentation. Okay, first, uh, I'd like to say just I appreciate the opportunity to address this committee and importantly to hear the comments back. Uh, our economic research at the commission uh, clearly benefits from hearing the uh, inputs of market participants and uh, it helps us to focus the research in impactful directions that help us to uh, develop appropriate and thoughtful regulations, which is of course one of our key jobs. Uh, I'll say that I'm particularly proud to be addressing issues of agricultural interest today. As uh, Chairman Gensler said, this is not the largest space in the markets that we regulate, but it is uh, key uh, in terms of the history and the mission of the CFTC. And I'll say uh, I'm personally mindful of this, having grown up on a farm in Alabama myself. And if you go upstairs, you'll see the toy farm machinery that I played with as a child up on my bookshelves. And it's a constant reminder about the end users and the importance that they have in this market. So. With that in mind, um, you know, part of our motivation here to think about the RIN market, this renewable identification number market, uh, is to understand some of the details, both from that top-down perspective in terms of the, the fundamental forces of supply and demand that these markets are supposed to reflect, uh, as well as some of those micro issues. And we're very mindful always of how markets trade and the structure of these markets. Uh, and this is a, a particularly interesting market. It's one, frankly, that uh, we haven't focused on as much as we have our traditional uh, agricultural markets. And that's because this market has only existed for a few years. So perhaps we can be forgiven for that. Um, the thing that caught everyone's attention, of course, was the fact that, as, as uh, we just heard, the price of these RINs, these tradable credits that uh, refiners have to produce to show compliance with the EPA law, spiked up from about a nickel to a dollar within the span of a couple of months towards the end of 2012. Uh, this caught everyone's attention, and what we've seen recently is even though those prices came off a bit down to 60, 70 cents, they've trended back up, but they've continued to show the volatility. And, and again, they, they went gone from $1.40 a few days ago back to um, you know, much lower levels. So actually, if I, I'll just go back for a second. This is the D6 RIN, which we were just talking about, which is the corn-based ethanol. There are some different flavors of these RINs, if you'll uh, 
allow me that pun. Um, the D4 and D5, they represent different types. So uh, the D4 biodiesel, that's more of a soybean-based type product, and the D5 is, is another type, more advanced biofuel. The, the main point from this is those prices did seem to be moving in line with the regulations. So we didn't observe on the face of it these prices at least being out of line with each other and their relative levels uh, whenever we evaluated them uh, to, to just uh, you know, see what the prices looked like. Because from the regulations, which are in fact a bit complex uh, relative to what you might think, uh, the obligated parties who have to deliver these RINs to the EPA can deliver D4 or D5 RINs as well as D6 RINs. So if they have to deliver D6, they could substitute D4 or D5. Substitution only works one way, though. So these D6 RINs have to be less than or equal to the D4 or D5 RINs. So at least we observed that. Um, we started to dig a little further. We understood exactly the same story, that, that given the status quo, uh, the regulations impose um, requirements on the blending, which, given the status quo for marketing, for shares of the different types of products, for the amounts that have to be blended, that you would see uh, the amount that had to be blended exceeding the amount uh, that the market could, uh, could contain with the current technology. Scott, can you go back to the prior page? Just, I'm just sorry. Yes. So the mandate is a governmental set of actors, the Environmental Protection Agency, that says you must have this much biofuel. Is that what the blue is? That's correct. That many, that many gallons. And the red, what is a blend wall? Uh, I, you know. So this, this represents um, a number of assumptions, but it's basically what industry says. They, that's the maximum amount they can blend given the gasoline they're expecting to sell. So at a 10% ethanol rate, that's as much as they can put in. That's as much as they can use in a so given year So when the government says you only need the blue, the value of the RINs was small, but Negligible. is it as simple as when the blue passed the red 2013, all of a sudden everybody, there's like a, uh, a chase around the market, uh, almost like a squeeze to buy these, these. Uh, I, I wouldn't use the word squeeze, but. Oh, uh, I, I'm not sure, but, but, <laughs> but yeah, okay. But, but effectively, yes, and that's the, the, but on this next slide, that's what the analysts have said is the fundamental explanation, that the only way that given this technology and the infrastructure, that this difference will be made up is by buying RINs, buying these credits, uh, even if you don't use them, buying the credits to deliver to the EPA. And the assumptions in the models, the assumptions that they're using is that this supply of RINs that they've been building up over the past couple of years will be completely depleted sometime in 2014. So they become valuable as this constraint becomes fairly binding. And this was something that had been identified by some analysts. Some of these papers you see at the bottom, some of the uh, ag economists had started uh, uh, identifying this issue as a, um, you know, a, a real barrier that you'd have to get through. And, and uh, you know, you can see some of the titles. Something has to give. Why isn't the conventional rent price higher? So the fact they were to nickel, the analysts were saying the value really should be much higher. And so we started to see it much higher. It doesn't say as much about the volatility or the exact level. But it, it does give that fundamental based explanation of, of some of the issues that are out there in the market. So, you know, at that level, we understood a little bit about that top down issue, the set of policies, the set of market structures that were giving rise to these issues that were uh, causing people to, to put a lot of attention on these markets. And then the next step is to really think about the, the bottom up part. So, we're very mindful about the, uh, um, the way that these things trade. Uh, this, as I said, it's, it's not a traditional commodity derivative uh, until recently, uh, whenever the exchanges launched futures contracts on RINs. And so we did the research. Uh, this is our preliminary due diligence that I can share some of it with you. Uh, we talked to market participants to understand what they were doing. We talked to some of the brokers of RINs. Uh, these products have only existed for a few years, and prior to 2010, it's really uh, a spreadsheet-based market. And so you can imagine if these things are 38-digit 
strings of numbers reflecting gallons of ethanol, you can imagine that might lead to some sort of transcription errors, fat fingers errors, difficulties uh, in terms of uh, dealing with the market. And so the EPA set up the moderated transaction system. So this is not a traditional market. It's not a centralized uh, limit order book when you think about an exchange. Uh, it's, it's really more of a back office type accounting system as we understand it. So transactions occur. They occur outside of the system, but then they're basically booked into this EPA system. So the participants can see what they've done, they see the transactions they've done, but they don't see the entire marketplace. So this is something they get from their brokers. Uh, they talk to brokers uh, who are in this market. So there is some post-trade transparency that the EPA gets. The transactions have to be booked uh, into this system generally within a few days. Uh, and then there are reports that uh, are due at the end of a quarter. And as we talk to the brokers, we get a little bit more color. Uh, really, they're just estimates by the brokers, uh, guesses about what they see in the marketplace. They obviously see their own slice of the market. They can give us ideas about what might be out there. Uh, but they, the guesses we've heard were perhaps 20 to 25 different brokers who dealt in these markets, send out market sheets. Uh, they give an idea about uh, the prices they're seeing in the market, the interest they're seeing. The numbers they suggest are that out of the 2.6 billion RINs that were available at the end of 2012, uh, on a slow day, you might have seen 5 or 10 million RINs trade. On a much more active day, when there was a lot more volatility, you might have seen maybe 100 million RINs trade. Uh, and in terms of the bid and the ask prices that they seem to see in the market, they indicate that back in 2012, when these RINs were not particularly valuable, when they were trading around a nickel, you saw the spread effectively be around two-tenths of a penny. So that's about 3 or 4% wide, which sounds reasonably wide. Uh, 2013, middle of the year, or sorry, maybe middle of the spring, you saw them around 70 cents. S spread still tended to be about 3 or 4% wide. Recently, um, it, it's, it's not uh, obvious to us exactly why it might be a little bit smaller, except the numbers are a bit larger. Um, it seems like the spreads might be slightly smaller than they were before, but you still see spreads that are one and a half or two percentage points wide. That's very large compared to what we think about typically in, say, futures markets. But, uh, you know, it might be what you might see in a more traditional cash market. So this was, um, you know, certainly some of the color we were interested in understanding, partly, again, because we saw the futures markets starting to overlay derivatives contracts on top of these RIN instruments. And then, uh, as we also heard alluded before, um, there were some difficulties in the market. Uh, it's an evolving market. It's a young market. And so one of the difficulties that uh, was observed was from 2010 and 2011, there were some fraudulent trades that were entered for D5 can RINs. I, can I just uh, caution? These are alleged frauds. These are not frauds by the CFTC's Division of Enforcement or anything The like CFTC that. Division of Enforcement has had no, no, no connection no, no. with this. This is just this, what some the, market people are saying. The, right. the color from market participants, although we have had trials and uh, people have, and yeah. convictions, uh, violations of the Environmental Protection Act, as I understand it. Um, the, the impact of this was that we saw, according to the market participants, uh, liquidity drying up for some of the smaller plants, some of the smaller refiners. Uh, if they weren't well known to some of the potential purchasers of RINs, that they had the, the counterparty credit risk that the purchasers were very mindful of since they bore it completely. Uh, there have been some fixes, as I understand. Uh, there's a, a proposed rule from 2013 to validate these RINs. But the EPA is, is not a validation entity for these RINs. Um, and the story, again, that the market participants have told us is that we have seen some financial institutions enter the market, uh, but they've had difficulties establishing some of those relationships. They're not refiners. They're not in those uh, markets. They don't know the same people. So even if they're well-known financial entities uh, within those circles, they're not that well-known within these particular circles. And so trading desks who might bring liquidity to these markets have not uh, had as much traction as you might hope because their counterparty credit risk issues are still perceived to be uh, issues for them. Um, so this, 
you know, again, says to us, this is a very young market. It's an evolving market. It's one that only very recently, uh, over the last couple of months, had futures markets that were introduced on it. They haven't gotten a lot of traction. The number of contracts is uh, quite small. Uh, open interest is quite small. Uh, but it's one that we're watching very mindfully because it is connected with a number of the other products and commodities that we're interested in at the Commission, corn, soybeans, uh, gasoline, ethanol, and so forth. And so this is a, an active area for us to be considering in terms of uh, thinking about it in the research side. Thank you, uh, Philip and Scott. Any discussion about the RINs markets or the activities currently going on? I think if I would have been a wise investor, I would have bought RINs about five years ago or four years ago. Well, a couple of points. Uh, the, uh, when the RIN market was created by Congress, and the, the standard, the, and the, if you go back to your graph that shows the blend wall, uh, the Congress very carefully decided that uh, RINs accumulated two years ago uh, would become invalid. So if you had gone and bought those RINs five years ago, they would have become worthless. Uh, this, I've been living in a, as an economist with environmental regulations for years, and one of the things they, right. they try to do is block every, every opportunity so that a RIN, a RIN that was generated in 2011 from selling gasoline with 10 percent ethanol, which had no value in 2011, could have been used to meet a, 20, a 2012 obligation, but it could not be used to meet a 2013 obligation. Similarly, you have 2012 obligations that can be used, RINs accumulated in 2012 that are being used to, for 2013. That's why both of our graphs show prices for 2012 and 2013. But those 2012 RINs expire at the end of the year. They cannot be used for 2014. To make things even more complicated, the regulations say you can only carry 20 percent of your 2012 RINs forward to 2013. And if you're deficit in 2014, you can, you can use 2015 up to a certain point. But the environmental regulations are roughly five times as long in terms of federal reg register pages for an economic impact as a CFTC regulation. So you think Dodd-Frank is bad, uh, EPA is worse or more complicated. The situation is even more complicated because if that blend wall were it reached, the EPA administrator, now in office, has the right to change it or to relax the standard to meet so that uh, the situation can be changed, which makes any kind of a, a trading of any kind of a financial instrument in something like this even more difficult. They, uh, last year, they changed the D1, D2 for bio, uh, for uh, uh, cellulosic ethanol because there was no cellulosic ethanol there. So I, it is, this is a, a, a extremely complicated. I know the CFTC has had difficulties. Uh, you've managed to work with the FTC, uh, FERC, uh, but it's difficult. It's going to be even more difficult in trying to work with the Environmental Protection Agency given the authorities the administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency has to change the rules uh, unilaterally. I, I just have a question for the committee, not the presenters, with sure. all respect. How is this affecting the markets for corn and soy, and what are you seeing? And, and secondly, what issues for this agency? I think um, we've been following the RIN price pretty closely in Nebraska. We're, I think, the second largest ethanol producer in the country. Um, We've seen petroleum marketers in our area that are making around a dollar twenty gallon, dollar and twenty cents per gallon profit on E85 because of the RIN price. Currently, they're not passing it on to their customers. Uh, the customers don't realize this because they don't understand the RIN market. But from what we've seen, at least, um, if you would, uh, the the petroleum industry has blocked E15 from use. Uh, even those stations that have chosen to market E15 have uh, come under contract disputes with the petroleum industry. So they're if essentially they're blocking E15 use, which would lower the price of RINs. It's a conscious choice of theirs. And I think the RIN market is going to be extremely volatile. 
and especially if suddenly we start using more E85 and the demand for those RINs drops because I think uh, looking at the mandates that we can use that amount if we choose to, but right now there's a conscious effort not to. Um, there was a, before I came down here, kind of a wire story that said RINs dropped uh, 50 cents over the last week. Um, any sense of what contributes to this immediate volatility? Um, do you have any sense at all, any thoughts on it? Yeah, um, in the paper, uh, I tried, and I think I'm the, I've made the first real hard attempt to figure out what an equilibrium price for a uh, RIN is this year. And if you work at it two or three different ways, you come out with about 90 cents. Now, this is a commodity. And so, as, as Scott said, the price had gone to $1.40. You expect markets to overshoot. And, but if you work through carefully and look at the limited information that's available, and I've, I've been working with a firm in Minnesota that markets a lot of gasoline, and we have been passing through the, the, the benefit to see. Our goal is to see what the consumer response is, how much, what the price elasticity of substitution is. And uh, when you work through this and you look at the substitution, 80 to 90 cents is maybe a dollar is about the right price this year, but markets overshoot. I mean, they've been overshooting for 200 years, and the largest problem here is uncertainty on regulation, the lack of data. The Energy Information Agency provides no information on the volumes of E10, E15, or E85 sold, so we don't know the quantities. So all you can see is the prices. Uh, you have the Bloomberg, I rely on uh, Argus Media. Uh, we, the, so the prices are uncertain. This is really a, a, what did they call them in the Wall Street, a pink sheet market. So you, you're going to see a huge amount of volatility. But the, 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 the market clearing mechanisms are there. They're just not as transparent as in many of our other bonds. If I were going to draw an analogy to financial markets, I'd say this is a little more obscure than the uh, uh, municipal bond market where the margins tend to be very large. Yeah, I'm just back to the committee again, I, with all respect. MJ, anybody, I mean, is, I'm, I'm, I'm not familiar with this RIN market. I'm just looking what's happening on the ground for farmers, or is this not in their the, They're thoughts? aware of it, but it's, it's one of those where it's, it's a complex market, uh, and, and the comments have been right on target. The value of RINs does have a connection to the value of corn, but it's an indirect valuation, not a direct valuation, uh, because it has to do with ultimately the incentives that you might have for particular types of ethanol, not only production, but blending and, and opportunities that come with that. But the substitution effect also brings in the soybean oil market in biodiesel, and you've had a recent drop, some would call it a collapse, in the soybean market, the spot soybean market, of $1.50 in the last let, three let days. Let me ask a simple question. Do farmers, does somebody who's planting corn or soy benefit if the RIN price is high or low? I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to understand. The, no, the higher the RIN price, the more incentive there is to produce ethanol. And does that in any way then feed back to somebody on the farm? I, I guess I'm saying no. I guess from, from my standpoint, I don't think the RINs price has had a lot of impact on ethanol production. Um, okay. it, it, and, uh, the RIN uh, transfers with the gallon of ethanol, so it's, it's whoever uses that ethanol to blend with who can use that RIN in their marketing ability. We're about just a couple minutes into our lunch period. Is there one more comment from the committee or question? Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Yeah, um, to, to a direct effect to the farmer and the price. I, I don't believe that it's it's tracked that well by the by the farmer back down to the farm. Now, if they have investments in ethanol facility and things like that, yeah, they might be more in tune with the uh, RIN value. But um, a quick question: besides the D6, can can you comment a little bit more about the comparison and? Of the valuations between the D5 and D4, is there any 
when the D6 value changes, is, is, is there any correlation between the D4, 5s, and 6? <laughs> um, well, I, you know, my first comment, of course, is that we are not a price-setting agency, so I just want to get that out there. Uh, but, you know, you can look at the chart here, and based on my understanding of the regulations, um, because of that deliverability of the D4 or D5 to uh, satisfy the D6 obligation, uh, you will see them have at least as much value as the D6. And so prior to the D6 RINs having much value, having, you know, a value of about a nickel, the, the D4 and D5, so that the more, the second generation biofuels, for example, they were more valuable. There are different restraint, constraints that the, that the EPA has put out for them. Um, and then as the D6 constraint became more binding, they became, they seem just from the picture to be more closely related. But, you know, those are just observations from this particular chart. I'm going to suggest we go ahead and, uh, and break for lunch. We can continue this discussion at lunch. Looks like at least several people got back from lunch. Okay. Uh, what we're going to do this afternoon is, uh, is uh, talk about the issue of voice recording and the voice recording requirements. Uh, we have three different uh, panel members, and then, as always, we'll hear their presentations and then throw it open for comments or questions. Um, first speaker is Ward Griffin, who's a division of swap dealer and intermediary, intermediary oversight. Those I words are killing me. Uh, Vic, Vince McGonagall, who's with the Division of Enforcement, and Scott Cordes with CHS Hedging. I think we're going to start with Ward. So go it, ahead. It's, it's Vince McGonagall. Oh, sorry. What did I say? Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's the wrong glasses. <laughs> uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Ward Griffin, and I am the Associate Chief Counsel of the CFTC's Division of Swap Dealer and Intermediary Oversight. I would like to take a moment to thank Dr. Fortenberry and the members of the Agriculture Advisory uh, Committee for allowing us the opportunity uh, to discuss the new oral record keeping requirements under Reg Regulation 1.35. On December 21st, 2012, the Commission published in the Federal Register final rule amendments to Regulations 1.31 and 1.35 that will require futures commission merchants, retail foreign exchange dealers, certain introducing brokers, and certain members of designated contract markets or swap execution facilities to record and retain records of oral communications. The Commission noted that the overarching purpose of the final rule amendments was to promote market integrity and protect customers. And the Commission believes that the, commission, uh, that the collection of and access to searchable records, both oral and written, are indispensable tools the Commission needs to ensure market integrity and to protect customers. As noted by the Commission in the preamble of the final rule release, the markets have undergone a significant transformation over the last few decades, and in particular, over the last few years. Technological advances have contributed to tremendous growth, including significant numbers of retail customers, as well as greater interconnectedness with order flow distributed across multiple trading centers. These changes have required the Commission to adapt, and these rules are part of that adaptation. The Commission sought, excuse me, sought through the proposed rule amendments to conform the existing record-keeping requirements of Regulation 1.35A to the record-keeping requirements for swap dealers and major swap participants as set forth in Regulation 23.202, which were finalized by the Commission in the spring of 2002. The Commission published the final rule amendments in the Federal Register and solicited comments. The Commission received many comments in response to the proposal. The Commission considered those comments pri prior to issuing the final rule amendments, and the Commission narrowed the proposed amendments in several significant areas in response to those comments. Comments to these proposed amendments to Regulation 1.35 primarily focused on a handful of key areas, each of which was discussed by the Commission in the preamble of the final rule. First, commenters addressed, excuse me, first, commenters addressed the oral record keeping requirement generally. Such commenters discussed the costs involved in such requirements, as well as the necessity and feasibility of such a requirement. Second, commenters addressed the applicability of the proposed rule amendments to members of DCMs and CEFs, including commercial end users and non-intermediaries who are not registered with the Commission, to keep records of their cash commodity transactions. Third, 
Commenters addressed the proposed requirement that each re uh, record be maintained in a separately identifiable electronic file, also known as tagging. Additional other issues were raised by commenters. We need not go through the full range of comments here today, but to point out three such comments. Number one, there were requests for a significant compliance timetable. Two, there were requests for alternative treatment for smaller firms. And three, there were requests for a, a shorter re record retention period than what had been proposed. As noted by the Commission in the final rule release, the final rules will significantly advance the Commission's efforts to detect and, def and defer abusive, disruptive, fraudulent, and manipulative acts and practices that seriously harm market integrity and customers. The information will benefit the Commission in its market analysis efforts, such as investigating and preparing market reconstructions and understanding causes of unusual market activity. Plus, the requirement that records be kept current and readily available facilitates the timely pursuit of potential violations, which can be vitally important in seeking to freeze and recover any profits received from illegal activity. However, to address comments received from the public, the Commission incorporated several changes to what had originally been proposed. Again, these changes reduced the burden in several significant ways from what had been proposed. First, the oral record keeping requirement will be limited to those oral communications that lead to a transaction in a commodity interest and related cash or forward transactions. This represents a reduction from the proposal which would have applied the requirement to commodity interest and cash commodity transactions. Second, acknowledging that implementing and maintaining an oral communication recording system would be overly burdensome for small entities and the commercial end user, non-intermediary members of a DCM or CEF, the Commission excluded from the new requirement small introducing brokers, oral communications of a floor broker who is a member of a DCM or CEF that do not lead to the purchase or sale uh, for any person other than the floor broker, and certain members of a DCM or CEF, including floor traders, commodity pool operators, and members that are not required, I'm sorry, that are not registered or required to be registered with the Commission in any capacity. The Commission also permitted covered persons to contract with other Commission registrants to retain the required records, provided that the records retained by the contractor registrant are the same records, thus allowing covered persons to avoid retaining the same records as other Commission registrants. Third, the Commission removed the requirement that each transaction be maintained as a separate electronic file. Instead, the final rule requires that such records be kept in a form and manner identifiable and searchable by transaction. This eliminated the so-called tagging requirement. Fourth, the Commission significantly reduced the retention period for the oral records from five years, as had been proposed, to one year. The Commission also significantly extended the amount of time that affected entities would be afforded to come into compliance with the final rule with respect to the recording of oral communications. In doing so, the entities subject to this rulemaking were afforded the same, approximately the same amount of time as had been given to swap dealers and major swap participants to come into compliance with their requirements under Regulation 23.202. All affected CFTC registrants must be in compliance with the oral record, rec oral record keeping requirements of Regulation 1.35 by December 21, 2013, which will mark the one year anniversary of the publication of the final rule in the Federal Register. Likewise, similar to the treatment afforded to swap dealers and major swap participants, the Commission delegated to the Division of, I'm sorry, to the Director of the Division of Swap Dealer and Intermediary Oversight the authority to grant alternative compliance schedules to affected registrants. Specifically, the Commission delegated to the Director of DSIO the authority to establish an alternative compliance schedule for a firm that requests one, provided that the firm establishes that it is technologically or economically impracticable for the firm acting in good faith to comply with the oral record keeping requirement within a reasonable time period beyond December 21st, 2013. Because the rule requires the director of DSIO to make findings on this issue, the burden is on the firm to produce sufficient documentation showing that, notwithstanding the good faith efforts to achieve full compliance prior to December 21st, 2013, full compliance is technologically or economically impracticable. The Division has learned from the experiences over the past several months in terms of the compliance efforts, uh, efforts of swap dealers and major swap participants concerning the oral record keeping requirement. One point that I would like to stress is that time is of the essence. 
The final rule was published over seven months ago, and affected firms already should be well underway in working towards full compliance. With less than five minutes, I'm sorry, excuse me, with less than five months remaining until the compliance date, affected firms that have not yet initiated the process should do so immediately. Although vendors have informed us of the existence of cost-effective, off-the-shelf applications, firms should allow themselves plenty of time to allow for the installation and testing of such applications. That concludes my prepared remarks today. With that, I will hand the microphone over to Vince McGonigal with the Commission's Division of Enforcement. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Ward. I'm just going to briefly touch on a couple of topics. The purpose uh, for the audio taping rule. I became involved with the record keeping requirements in the agency on a more formal basis several years ago. There was an interdivisional group that was established uh, that I referred to as the record keeping task force. And at that time, we, we along with representatives from uh, then DMO, DCIO and OGC talked about uh, where we thought uh, record keeping should go in the future and, and what what we thought needed to um, have changed. We followed closely what other regulators were doing, uh, what SEC had on the books, FINRA, uh, where FCA came out with an audio taping rule uh, just a few years ago in 2009. And so we sort of have this backdrop of we know uh, that entities out there that are interested in uh, following the transactions that they're entering into, that a good number of those entities were already taping their, their conversations. And we thought from an enforcement standpoint, audio tapes uh, of those conversations is an important component of the enforcement program. The rule made clear that the purpose of the audio taping rule is to promote market integrity and protect customers, and Ward's talked about that pretty extensively. Some of the enforcement matters, without delving into any specifics, but I can say generally, and to the extent that anyone has been looking at our web page for the past year, we'll see a number of actions that reference evidence as part of either the findings of the commission or in allegations of the complaint that are based on audio tape conversations. The types of cases that I'm referring to include the following. Allegations involving disclosures of material non-public customer information, segregation, failure to supervise, speculative limits, wash sales, non bona fide prices, fraud, false reporting, and manipulation. And so uh, literally just over the course of the past three few years from enforcement actions, you see a broad range of activity, enforcement related activity, that relies on and uses audio taped information. In reviewing comments to the proposed rule, we were, we were cognizant of concerns that individuals had with respect to how that might affect them uh, as small players potentially in the market versus uh, the larger market interest that they thought that enforcement was focused on, particularly man manipulative activity. But as, uh, as I've talked about here, we are looking at broad customer protection relief as well as market integrity issues. We did, however, narrow the scope of the rule to focus on entities that deal only with customers. And we think in doing that, we try to hopefully strike a balance that, uh, that preserves for the division information that is most likely to be of concern with respect to an enforcement investigation. I can tell you, though, you know, my personal feeling with respect to uh, taping transactions, more, more is better. Uh, however, I think that the rule here is a, is a great approach, and I am very thankful that the Commission uh, considered and passed it. With respect to searchability, we've received, of course, a number of questions following uh, the rule um, coming out this past December concerning how entities should prepare themselves with respect to searchability. In the rule guidance, it sets forth some, some information that I think is helpful. The record keeper should be able to readily access and identify records pertaining to a transaction or a counterparty by running a search of the raw data. So what does that mean? Well, basically, if you have off-the-shelf uh, data analytics, that those analytics should have the ability, for example, if the Division of Enforcement sends a subpoena or a request for information where we're looking for trading information on a particular date or by, on a particular line or by a particular individual, that 
uh, those individuals who are responding to our requests should be able to run the analytics available currently um, from these software programs and start a production that's focused on responding to those requests. Compliance with searchability, as I said, can happen through the use of commercially available products capable of conducting speech analytics on recordings. Both landlines and mobile telephones should be recorded. Covered persons must ensure that covered communications do not occur on personal phones that lack the recording capability. The Commission also indicated that it did not adopt any explicit safe harbors. However, the Commission recognized that it will consider good faith compliance with policies and procedures that are reasonably designed to comply with the oral communications component. Thank you. Thank you for uh, allowing me the opportunity to speak. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk uh, to this rule a little bit, and I want to add some, uh, some uh, color and a little bit of clarity on, on some of the issues that, uh, that I see as a, uh, an FCM and maybe some of the other uh, folks in the agricultural industry. I know there's others within uh, our National Council of Farmer Cooperatives group that have uh, this issue as well. And really what I want to talk to a little bit is how you comply with some of this stuff and some of the challenges we have. And we have one example that I want to walk through just a little bit here that I think impacts uh, some of the folks in the room here and, and how we look at that. What I want to talk about is uh, within CHS Hedging, we have branch offices around the countryside. And you'll see on the screen, I've got just some, uh, some dots where they are. They represent 64 different branch offices that we have around. They're branch offices of the FCM. They operate and act a lot like an introducing broker, but they are a branch office. Just to give you a little idea what the profile of these branch offices are, um, most of these are a relationship with what I would say is the local cooperative or the local entity. And uh, we have the individual that is licensed and registered there. We have oversight, we have auditing, but they're an employee of that local organization. And they're offering these uh, commodity brokerage services as something ancillary to uh, their other daytime activities. Most of these branch offices you'll see uh, range in a uh, revenue stream of maybe $5,000 a year to $250,000, probably an average of $20,000. Uh, they'll handle trades of maybe a total of $100,000 for the year, up to $4,000. Most of them are dealt around uh, commodities such as the grain and the livestock. Um, Lots of times what happens is this individual that's registered there and licensed is also maybe the person that's buying grain from farmers to that location. Uh, and what will happen lots of time is the farmer might come in and say, you know what, I'd like to talk about the markets. Uh, I want to protect my crop, but I'm maybe not ready to sell you grain. Is there another way that I can manage my risk, i.e., can I use my futures account? So there's that education, that ongoing that goes there. Once trades take place, they uh, probably will call us or they will have an electronic order entry on their screen in their office that they can place the trade. From there, as the FCM in the home office, we will manage that order flow. We'll have oversight to that order flow. We'll handle the margin calls, money to moving back and forth, that sort of thing. You might ask a little bit, you know, what's the value here if there's not a high volume flow that's taking place at these, uh, these branch offices? Lots of times it gets down to that farmer, that rancher at that local level. They have a trusted local contact they can deal with. There's easy access. They can come in and see them. They can call them on the phone. Uh, there's an education process that takes place. There's market intelligence, uh, consultation, and really it offers them another risk management choice. So with what I've described about what the profile, what these branch offices look like, today, the way the rule is written, these branch offices would have to comply with oral taping requirements because technically they are part of the FCM as a branch office and as an FCM we're required to tape. Now we do that already today in our home office. We also do it in our two major other offices that I have employees at, Kansas City and Indianapolis. So we have that searchable record type thing there. But it gets into these branch offices, it comes down to what is economically and what is technically feasible to do. So we have this question about recording costs and benefits. 
if we go forward with compliance, will these branch offices drop off because you can't comply with it? Then what happens to the risk management choices at that local level to the farmer? We also run a little bit of a challenge around cell phones being searchable and how you can uh, tag that kind of thing. So with there, I wanted to give the rest of the committee an opportunity to see some of the things that we see out there. I know there's other firms and other situations, probably some similar things. I would say maybe some solutions going forward outside of a no action letter is maybe looking at the rule a little bit and say, can it be looked at in a similar fashion to what the IB you carved out for the smaller type thing? Is there a revenue stream by location? Is it a physical location? Is it specific commodities? Um, I would also point out these branch offices don't deal in over-the-counter transactions. It's all exchange-traded type products. So there's probably some solutions that can be had if you want to identify them those ways. But um, hopefully my presentation here is helpful to give the rest of the committee and uh, the commission here some uh, insight to what's taking place. Yeah, thanks, Ward, Vince, and Scott. Go ahead. Scott, if I could just ask, just as an example, because uh, you're in the field and you have a sense of this. So three of your 64 offices, you tape and th this oral recording, just focusing on those three offices, this oral recording rule is at least aligned enough with what you already do. That's, that, I'm not taking, that's not where the issue is coming. It's coming from possibly the other 61 offices. <laughs> Yeah, that's correct. It would be the other ancillary offices that uh, uh, we don't have the size and scale yet. They're adding a valuable service to the uh, local and agriculture so community. So of, of those 60-odd other offices, how many of them have, uh, you know, these wonderful pictures, but how many of them are just like the one-person office? Uh, are, uh, I just don't have a sense. Yeah, I would have to think right off the top of my head. Um, it would be the majority of them. There might be, I think, one or two where there might be two people licensed, but neither one of them is it a full-time job for them. It's, it's, a, it's ancillary to their other duties that uh, they maintain at that location. So you're, you're saying there's like your three hubs and then there's 60 others that either have one or two people in them. That would be correct. And they're only doing futures only. Only doing futures. All right, thanks. That, that's helpful. I just you know, yep. Discussion? Yeah. Just as a further clarification of that, Scott, when you talk about that one licensed person in that location, he might or she might only have maybe 15 or 20 minutes a day maybe dealing with the futures. They're also running the scale or del taking delivery of corn that farmers bring in to sell or whatever. Is that correct? I mean, to get... Yeah, it could be that simple. Some might be 15 minutes a day. Some might not look at it for a day or two. Uh, the nice thing they have with being a branch is we give them intel and information that they can pass down to the local. But as far as their time requirement, uh, it could vary. I mean, some would do more, but to a lot of them, it's it's not a it's a smaller part of their uh, daily duties. Could maybe either of you guys clarify a little bit? Um, I know there's a distinction between um, what's required for uh, a member of an exchange versus um, someone who's not a member of an exchange? If you'll bear with me, I'll pull the exact language up. Could you also expand, you know, there's a little talk about, talks about cash transactions. I think some people think if they're dealing in cash commodities that they would have to tape a rule, but I don't that's yeah, no, no, no. Rule, right. right. There, 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 there are two components, and, and Scott was pointing out a, a second component, and, and I'll deal with that very quickly first. There were, there were a number of concerns with how the proposed rule had been phrased, that it would uh, include uh, cash commodity transactions, which if you're a, a, a non-registrant member of a contract market, uh, that you know, you, you, and you're, you're engaging in these cash commodity transactions that are not related uh, to a commodity interest transaction that it was going to, it, 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 it would expand the burden into an area where the commission doesn't, you know, hasn't traditionally had any, any you know, jurisdictional interest uh, to, to, to get into. And there was this, you know, legitimate cost-benefit question there that is the burden that's being placed there, is it appropriate uh, and or is it, is it, is it um, uh, uh, from a cost-benefit perspective, uh, a, a good idea, and the commission 
uh, looked at that and said, well, no, it's not. And so the, you know, to deal with that first component, uh, the commission had changed the language uh, from the proposed rule to the final rule so that those, you know, cash commodity transactions, that that is, that is out. So that, you know, addressed a, a fair amount of, of, of the concern with respect to the commodity markets. But, um, go ahead. And is that only if you're not a member of an exchange? Or what if you're doing cash contracting but are also a member of an exchange? Yeah, there, well, there, 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 there are two components. Uh, so first, you have, uh, if you're just engaging in cash commodity transactions, you're a member but you're not an FCM, uh, you're not, uh, you know, another registrant above a certain threshold or, you know, within certain parameters, I, there, I, I don't want to mix the two categories up too much. You know, on the one hand, you're talking about the types of transactions that would trigger the requirement, right? Then the second component is the nature of, 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 of who the registrant is. And there the commission got in, and again, this pertains specifically to the oral record keeping requirement alone. It does not pertain to uh, 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 written records and, and things of that nature. But uh, it's spelled out, and I'll give you the exact site. It's uh, Regulation 1.35A, excuse me. Well, it's at the end of A1, but it's uh, you know enumerated out uh, Romanets 1 through 8. And if you give me a second, I'll just I'll walk through those very quickly. Uh, again, the, the rule states you, that the you, you can send it to the committee, or I can send it to the committee whatever you like. A, just give it, you know, the best oral answer. That would be fine. Yeah, uh, it essentially it carves out uh, a number of folks. It carves out again oral communications that lead solely to the execution of you know a cash or forward transaction, just as we discussed. Um, it, it carves out uh, transactions by floor, floor brokers who are transacting for themselves. That there isn't you know communication with a customer out there. Uh, it carves out. Uh, what we call small IBs, uh, which are introducing brokers that uh, have uh, an aggregate uh, revenue from their IB business of uh, not more than five million total over the preceding three-year period, and you know others as well, floor traders, um, members of DCMs or CEFs that are not registered or required to be registered by the commission. I mean, all those uh, persons are strictly carved out, so it is it is not applicable. The oral record keeping requirement is not applicable to them. And this was, I mean, I hope, hopefully we got the right balance. The, the Scott raises the branch issue that we, we need to take a close look at. But what we tried to do is when we proposed uh, this, I want to say a year and a half, maybe two years ago, I think we got it too wide. I think it was too inclusive. And we got a lot of comments back from uh, your interest and other interests as well the FCN community, and we narrowed it as, uh, uh, you know, probably not completely to Vince's liking, <laughs> uh, but we, we uh, he's in the Division of Enforcement, so you can imagine, you know, where he, he'd come from. But the commissioners working together with the staff narrowed it and with these various uh, exceptions and carve-outs to really principally be members of exchanges, FCMs that are members, and then these introducing brokers that are over a certain size, as I remember. Is that? I, That's correct. Scott, does uh, this carving out of the cash transaction from the recording requirement, does, doesn't this take care of the 60-some branch offices? Or did I, did, I, did I miss something there? There are other activities that they're doing around cash. It does. but. The activities they would do around exchange traded products as a branch does not, because that's a futures transaction. Today, the way the rule is written, that would still bring them under that to uh, review. Well, Commodity Markets Council has been very interested in this issue for quite a while, and we, in fact, commented on it, and we were, we were happy to to get the uh, the, the relief that we got on the uh, oral recording. Uh, unfortunately, we feel like we've been a little bit duped and weren't paying close attention because at the same time we were getting relief on that, the definition of an electronic record was being expanded to the point of including a lot of 21st century analogs for phone calls. Today, you know, great, we, we have a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of grain is at least bought and sold initially with the phone call, but more and more it's with a text or an instant message that has completely replaced the whole actually talking to somebody. So we have the same issues 
from a technology perspective and a searchability perspective, trying to keep all these instant messages and everything else when we don't have to record the phone call. So we, we've got a, this is a big problem for the CMC membership, huge problem. In the case of my company in particular, we immediately just said no more doing anything with cell phones You can or, or texting with, with, with mobile devices. You have to actually make a phone call. So we have forced them into the area where you gave us some relief because we are, are unable to do it a lot of things with uh, mobile devices especially. So we don't think that's probably what the policy should have been. You know, we get relief to, from recording phone calls and that's what we're ironically forcing everybody to do now. So it's, it's a lot of members of CMC are very, very concerned. Sorry, your that. company is a registered FCM? No, we're just a member, we're a non-clearing member of a DCM. Non-clearing member, thank you. Yeah, just, I think the points being made here are salient from that perspective of there, there is an increasing amount of the transactions, particularly into things like branch offices, and et cetera, that are coming from the tractor seat, if you will, that are coming in the form of text and these other types of things. And um, I, I just would encourage the commission to take a look at what type of requirements and administrative burden are you imposing if you expand those things into recordings that go beyond the voice recordings of, of these other things. Uh, I probably do half of my cash grain transactions by text. Uh, and that's just the new technology. And I don't know of any technology. To be honest, I assume my texts are not being recorded someplace unless it's NSA. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, so I, I think as you look at the, the old requirement that assumed everything was by voice is rapidly changing. And in fact, there may be, again, different entities. I know internally, uh, just our, our company has rules that are based upon other agencies and other things with regard to how long you store emails. And if you extend this, what's the recording requirement? How long would these have to be stored? All these types of things become issues, I think, that uh, need to be taken at least into consideration as to uh, how, how extensive we're making these regulations and what the burden may be there. So if I, if I would walk into my broker's office and visit with him and tell him to place an order, then there's no communications that's recorded at all. That's correct. And so it's just the telephone conversations. You know, and I guess when I'm thinking now, the times that I've done this, um, there's sometimes he's on the road traveling quite a bit, and so I do it by phone, but then he will have to call it in, I take it. But now that I won't be able to do that anymore. I'll have to call his home office or somewhere and place my order because he couldn't no longer do that transaction is that correct are you are you talking about um like you know like a cell phone type situation where where, where he's on the road and I, I i if if it would depend on how the broker uh or the fcm how, how they would set up their their structure uh again i i you know drawing from the lessons that we that we've seen or that we've we've gotten over the last several months with the swap dealer uh in the swap dealer context the the, the mobile recording uh, has been something that 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 they have grappled with as well uh, to varying degrees of success and, and and talking about having the ability to to have these conversations when you're on the road when you're away from your office uh, one of one of the the, the the seemingly the more workable solutions uh, that firms have employed while they're hoping uh, while they're while they're expecting the mobile technology the mobile recording technology to improve uh, here in the re relatively near term as a, as a bit of a stopgap measure, uh, they are instructing their folks to, to essentially set up uh, bridge lines, bridge conference lines with the home office so that, you know, whether they're, you know, on the road going home or they're out at lunch or they're, you know, going to Chicago for something that, you know, they can still have that, that customer interface through their, their mobile handheld. It, the, the, call, the actual call itself, though, is just being routed through the home office 
there's a bridge conference line that then is is then being recorded and you know making sure the call is fully compliant and as i understand it now these are the swap dealers many of whom also control fcms uh, scott's firm's different um, I, I do recognize that but if you look at the major, some of the 10 or 15 largest uh, FCMs, they're broker dealers and they're part of the same swap dealer families. That's how they're addressing this. If I could just add, though, too, I would ask that uh, the staff and the commission do look a little bit at this cell re uh, phone recording issue. It really comes into what's a practical size and scale and what's at risk to the industry. Um, I know in our particular situation, I talked about our home office and other two primary offices. They tend to deal with farmers and commercial entities in the trade, probably a lot of the folks in this room. The majority of our business is transacted in the office on the phone, but with the extended trading hours that are out there, occasionally one of those employees could get a call from one of those customers on the way home or on the way into work. and. Uh, how do you handle all that? I mean, you're going to set up a bridging for each potential ones because it might happen once a week. It might happen once a month. Um, it's not the majority what takes place, but, you know, is it going to be strict that you have to cover every single phone call? So the commission did discuss this issue a little bit in coming out with the rule and talked about the concern if we didn't cover the use of mobile phones, that it would chase the business to mobile phones to an area then that wasn't captured. And, and so uh, I, I think uh, that, that's basically where the commission came out. It said, if you're going to use a mobile phone and that's going to be part of your business, then come up and use that technology that's available to record it or otherwise seek the alternative compliance schedule that Ward, Ward referenced and uh, you know, get that into uh, the commission as soon as possible. Yeah, as, as a producer, I'm, if I'm not making my own, the, my own trades on the CME, I, I'm calling one of those uh, similar uh, branches that, that Scott mentioned, but probably calling the employee on his personal cell phone because they're out, not necessarily sitting in the office because that's, like Scott said, that's not their full-time job necessarily. So I, I question, and, and maybe, you know, he then calls back to somebody in the office and actually tr makes a transaction. So I, I'm not sure where, how that's all getting recorded. And, and I don't quite, from, from my perspective, I'm not sure why it's necessary. I, I don't know exactly what problem you're tr we're trying to solve here, and what problem that we've had in the countryside that's trying to be addressed by this. That's a little bit what I feel. I mean, you're, you're doing this as a, protection for me as a hedger. I mean, um, I fail to see, I guess I'm not a speculator. I don't trade in, in large volumes. So are, by implementing this, is this a protection for the consumer? Me? Yes, or, very much so. It's about market integrity. Yeah. Our, our enforcement efforts, and this is true around the globe, whether it's in the United Kingdom or, or here or elsewhere, have more and more gone to saying that these uh, 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 dealers, I'm, I'm going to use the word broadly, um, uh, record their transactions and part of their record keeping is these uh, voice recordings. Uh, and th that's what's been implemented here for the, the swap dealers already. And, and it had a provision similar, I think, to this that uh, I can't remember what you called it, um, alternative compliance, is it? Where a futures commission merchant or dealer could say, no, it, actually the technology doesn't yet exist. We need more time. We need to change this. But it's broadly speaking to help promote market integrity, not that you're going to be a bad actor, but it's that somebody on the other side uh, what they're doing and you know we need to address and sort through Scott's issue of these one or two person offices I, I t you know I appreciate that uh, but um, but but the broad con conceptual framework is just to um, um, that a member I mean it, it was carved back it's really a member of an exchange that's uh, the, the futures commission merchants or the introducing brokers over a certain size, if I remember. 
and 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 it, not to try to stop somebody from the occasional cell phone call at night. That's not, you know, that's not the purpose. Maybe just to piggyback on a, a little bit on uh, Curtis's point as well. Um, when that call is made in the middle of the night uh, for that transaction, um, those that's going to represent a contract that then, then is going to be followed up in writing, required a signature coming back. So um, there there is another touch point after that uh, after that phone call. Any other? Yeah, go ahead. Don't, don't want to be a, a monopolizing time here or, or piling on, Mr. Chairman. But you know this. Lance, again, I we always have enjoy our exchanges. Many, many, <laughs> many of the members of CMC are. We have many of our members have exchange memberships. They're, we're non-clearing members. We do all of our business through an FCM. So the reason we're on the exchange, it's a economic. It's an economic reason that we've decided to join an exchange to because of the amount of trading we do to take advantage of the, the benefits of membership. That's the only reason we are seem to be caught and wrapped around the axle on this whole notion of, in our case, it's not the oral recording. Oral recording worked out for us. It's the written records that are associated with it because we're, we're really struggling with that. If, take a good example. I've got, my company's got hundreds of locations all across the country. On any given day, we'll be buying and selling all kinds of grains. We'll be buying corn from farmers in 20 different states. We'll be selling corn elsewhere. At the end of the day, we're not. We, every time we buy 5,000 bushels of corn from a farmer, we don't go hedge that discreetly. We have to look at our overall book, see where we are. Are we net long? Are we net short? Then we're going to go take that position to the exchange is what we'll do or adjust our position on the exchange. So the way we're you know, dealing with this written communication record is we that you know those, those cash transactions cumulatively are why we're ultimately doing our uh, our futures transactions. So you know, in an abundance of caution, we're looking at all those records, saying, okay, we've got to we've got to keep all that electronic communication that led up to those cash grain sales. And we, we we're not sure if that's very good policy. But we don't know. You know, we keep the records we have to with farmers that we we feel are commercially necessary. We don't you know any kind of communication we have with the farmer. Leading up to a sale, we still need a piece of paper. We're going to have a contract with that farmer, and that's the kind of stuff we keep. Any of the communications we're having up to that, we don't have to record our phone calls, but trying to keep text messages leading up to that, that is a huge burden, which is why we're not doing it right now. Let away from it. And, and to, to Lance's point even further, his, his competition may not be required to do that because they may not be ex a member of an exchange. So his elevator, you know, might be here have not being able to communicate via text because the burden of recording is too great but uh, uh, but the elevator or the cooperative system next door who's not a member of an exchange doesn't get tangled up in this and therefore isn't subject to those same requirements aside from the aside from the the policy point that I think you're trying to make I, I think you know one thing one point that's instructive is, is noting that the Commission said in, in the preamble uh, to the final rule that that there was actually an advisory uh, that our Division of Market Oversight uh, issued back in 2009 that uh, that addressed the, as you mentioned, the the 21st century, uh, you know, written communication, you know, electronic communication, uh, you know, component of, you know, the, the 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 relationship there, and that 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 DMO had come out with this advisory saying that under the pre-existing 1.35, before uh, this rule amendment uh, was 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 finalized in December. That uh, 1.35, you know, the older version already required uh, the retention of, of of these written records by members of uh, of, of designated contract markets. So, I, you know, I, I, I mentioned that just kind of in passing. Again, that doesn't address the underlying policy concern that's there, but I just want to make clear that at least it was the commission's view, by virtue of the DMO uh, advisory that was put out in 09, that. The, the 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 capture and retention of these written document writ, written communications were already required and uh, just re respectfully we i don't believe i think it's uh, accurate to say that uh, among the cmc membership no one was paying attention to uh industry guidance you know we have a hard enough time figuring out what the regs are and you know when you put out guidance saying here's what the reg means we most people were 
No, I think th so when the Most rule, people were not paying attention to that. When we have the clarification or talk, talks about electronic records, we're, we're talking, we're focused on what is the communication. The content of the communication is what's driving the uh, obligation to retain the records. That's what we're most interested in. And to the extent that folks wanted to get tripped up in the method of communication, I think the 2009 guidance came out that said, hey, don't get tripped up on the method of communication. If you want to text, that's within your business right to do that, but you need to retain it. And so I'm saying that more, maybe more forcefully as an enforcement uh, person uh, than, you know, you're going to hear from uh, other sides of the house. But the record keeping obligations uh, have been in 135 to members of the contract markets, FCMs, our feds, going back for, you know, a period of years, contract members of a contract market have been required to maintain records of cash transaction 25, 30 years now. And so I want to make sure that people are, you know, are focused on that and are thinking uh, that this isn't a new obligation when it comes to those transactions and you're doing your best to comply with those provisions. I think um, a lot of our membership has quickly caught up because we were caught a little off guard as well. Um, but I think we've quick, quickly caught up and, and made some decisions similar that if we can't track it, then we're not going to do it that way. However, um, again, there's a little bit of a, a dichotomy between what uh, a member of an exchange may have to do, even if even if they're clearing through an FCM, versus um, versus another their competition who may not be a member, and therefore may be able to not have to record. At least to, to some extent, with that, if you're talking about communications between the 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 member and the FCM with whom they're, they're going through. There is that component that the commission, you know, discussed that an FC, you know, the one registrant or, or, or one um, affected entity can contract out with, you know, another entity that has to maintain the same records uh, so that you don't have a requirement where both sides are, are, maintain, are being forced to maintain the same record. So in that case, if, you know, the extent that you're talking about communications between a, a member of a contract market uh, or Seth, for that matter, but, but member of a contract market and 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 the FCM through whom you know they 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 you know conduct business, there can be an agreement with the FCM that the FCM will you know retain those records for the required period. I'm talking more in the case of um, a farmer. A farmer calls up uh, someone at the elevator or, or texts someone at the elevator from from the combine and says, "Hey, what's what's December corn doing?" And get a text back says. Five dollars. Um, if you're a member of an exchange, the way um, our groups have been interpreting it, you have to somehow record, record, and make available that text. Whereas, if that farmer sends that to a member who is or a company who's not a member of an exchange, there's no obligation um, to, to retain that text on record. Thanks. I appreciate that. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Um, we're not, the company I work for is not in the same, doesn't have the issue that you have because we're not F, we're not one of those entities that have to keep track. But boy, let me tell you, when I listen to this conversation, something's not connecting here because th this is crazy to expect that the stuff that you were talking about has to be reported. Um, I can see the point when you are uh, Goldman Sachs and you make a multiple billion dollar transaction that you get it recorded and something something shows up so there's there's a there's a trail. But when you're talking about a farmer trying to protect their million dollar investment in their farm or two or three, whatever it ends up being, and they're calling about 4,000 or 5,000 bushels of corn, and you're going to treat them the same way as you're going to treat Goldman Sachs, I think there is a big disconnect between the people that are trying to do what they think is right with the practicality of what happens in the broader agricultural world. And I really would encourage you to revisit this thing, because this is a little bit out of control. And I, I hear you, but... Um the oral recording is exactly that's what we did. The farmer doesn't have to record anything. 
farmer doesn't no, have to I, record I, anything. I, I understand that, but the way the way these transactions happen is um, it's it's not going to happen in a way where uh, there's you know Goldman Sachs is going to be able to have pay somebody fifty thousand dollars to be a clerk sitting at a desk that can no, always. No, no, take we've got to address Scott's issue, this branch issue. I, I, I. And, and and this has been very helpful. I'm not uh, all of the issues, Lance is included. Um, all of the issues. Uh, that's because we're friends. Uh, but all of the issues are very helpful, and and that's what the advisory committee is about to bring these issues to us. But the farmer doesn't have to record it. I just want to. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, from from my standpoint. Uh, my my cooperative uh, representative, you know, which is uh, a full time guy from my cooperative, uh, they they have a policy where they refuse to ta accept texts as orders anymore, for that reason, and uh, and they they actually even discourage the phone call because uh, they want to have they don't want to have to do that. They want you to come in or or say uh, you know here's uh, we'll send you a sheet and you will sign this. So uh, it, it actually discourages farmers from actually making timely marketing decisions at this point because it, 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 that's the continued feedback. Scott, do you have a, any global issues? Not at this point, I don't. Uh, our firm has not stretched far enough outside the U.S. borders to be an issue yet, but uh, I'm sure there's probably other ones that do. I have a question here, and I know some of our members are affected by this, but I have not paid detailed attention to this. It sounds like the Commission is familiar with some of the technology that maybe the larger players are using, bridge technology. What, um, how is that functioning? And is that for incoming and outgoing calls, or how is that set up? I will admit I am not a uh, technology expert, so when I, when I, when I mention those things, I'm I, basically passing along feedback that, that we have received from uh, operations folks, that the, 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 the technological experts either internally here or, um, or at some of the affected firms. I, I'm not entirely certain how from a, you know, a, a system setup you know, system setup standpoint that would be constructed, but, but you know, we could, we'd be happy to talk with you further about that. Thanks, yeah, I mean, I'm just, shouldn't do this, but I'll think out loud. In terms of incoming calls, call forwarding seems to work, and I don't know if the technology is there as a problem to record because it's forwarding to a cell phone. So I guess then the issue might be uh, outgoing calls from a cell phone, or we just don't have enough information yet. Yeah, I think, I, I, and uh, Vince is right. I think, I think uh, with those generally, if you have an outgoing call, if you are, you know, uh, an AP of an FCM, and you want to, you know, talk with your customer, you are on the road, and 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 you want to call that person, that would generally involve calling into the home office and having it then conferenced over, you know, to, you know, whomever you're, whomever that, whomever that person is, is 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 calling. That's my understanding, but again, I'm, I don't profess to be a, an expert on technology. And does the recording have to be within the control of the entity that is, has the recording obligation, or can be a third party? Uh, um, how, do you, how do you mean that? <laughs> I'm looking at the, um, the entity that is, is doing the bridging, that is doing the, um, the, the connectivity between the, the incoming call. Can that be done through a third party, or does it have to be done through the party that has the recording obligation? No, I mean, the, the obligation and Vince can correct me if I'm if I'm wrong, but 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 the, you know the recording obligation goes to of course the registrant, uh, but you know, as as you'll have with 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 many different functions that are required uh, for a particular registrant, they'll contract with a with a third party vendor uh, to assist in this case with you know uh, recording uh, and even retaining uh, those you know, oral communications for you know whatever period of time. So in in, in that in that instance. It may not, I mean, when I said earlier that there are, or we've been told about, you know, many uh, uh, off-the-shelf applications that are available, 
when I mean when I say that, I mean you know there are there isn't a need for any affected you know for affected firms to have to go out and wholly construct from scratch an entirely new system that works for their for their program and fits within their you know their computers or whatever the case may be. That there are uh, applications out there because this has been in place in other contexts, you know, both domestically and internationally. Um, to varying degrees for a little while. And that has allowed the technology to become a bit more uh, mature. And, 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 and so it makes it, from, from what, again, from what we have been told repeatedly, that there are, there are a number of, 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 of opportunities out there. But back to your original question, who actually does it? I, I, I mean, the, the ultimate responsibility would be on the registrant itself. Uh, but if 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 they're relying on a third party vendor to assist in capturing and, and whatnot, I would believe that's perfectly fine. Yeah, I agree with Ward. I was just trying to find it somewhere in the uh, in the rule release, and I haven't been able to come up with it so quickly. I just want to offer, since our members have a lot of data security, uh, you know, responsibilities already, that if we can be of assistance, please let me know. Appreciate it. Thank you. I guess listening to this as a producer um, and seeing the costs of it, and it's going to get passed down to me, I guess the benefit cost ratio, I would say we don't need it. But that's my opinion. I, you're asking for it. You got it. Um, I just don't see the, the risk benefit is protecting my interests or the market's interest uh, when you're talking just the small hedger. Um, I don't see it. I can see the Goldman Sachs, some of the big companies, yes. I definitely would want to be recorded making transactions like that. But on our small scale, I, I don't see that it's ever going to be used. Um, I don't see a need for it. Hey, uh, Vince or Ward, do you want to comment on the, the cost-benefit analysis that we did on the rule and to respond to his question? Does it – how did – what – level of granularity did we take this? I'll start then. Well, Ward's reading. He can jump in. So the cost benefit analysis outlined uh, what we understood to be some typical costs. For example, commenters estimated that for participants using uh, one cloud-based solution, monthly fees would be about $90 a month. Uh, for mobile phones and approximately $50 a month for um, line and landlines. So we have, uh, for a few pages in the cost-benefit analysis, some level of granularity about what we understood from the community on these um, off-the-shelf software programs about what they anticipated uh, expenditures could be. And I haven't heard anything today uh, from the users about what costs associated they've seen, but I would certainly be interested in hearing that. Yeah, there, there's 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 a measure of granularity in terms of some of the some of the numbers, but I mean beyond that, beyond what Vince said, I don't have anything to add. Could 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 you guys share who who you uh, looked at? So the the cloud technology for ninety dollars a month and some of the others. Uh, is, would it be possible to to share the who, what companies technology you looked at? Yeah, I, I the. The rule that's available outlines what the enti who the entities were and the comment letters that they submitted that had those costs. And I'm looking at the costs, uh, I'm going by footnotes. So starting around footnote 91 is where you're going to see in the cost benefit analysis the cross reference to uh, what we were seeing or what we were hearing from the community about uh, potential costs for implementing an audio taping system. And in that in that particular area, and I again I can't speak. I don't have their their letter here in front of me, but uh, but the footnotes that Vince is to which Vince is referring uh, is a comment letter we received from a company called Compliant Phones, where they provided some uh, some information uh, on on these particular issues. I should stress, uh, as in terms of not just that particular comment letter, but all the comment letters, there is still a comment file that's uh, very much available on the commission's website. If you go on to the um, uh, the the the, 
Federal Register final rules page, and you pull this up. This again was from uh, December 21st, 2012. Uh, there is a link to the comment file that'll have that comment letter as well as all the others that the commission received. A again, just listening to the various issues, it's it's not one that, from my perspective, I deal with directly. Um, I use an online app and I trade directly. I don't go through, I don't make any calls unless somebody's website goes down. But the challenge is, I think there are a number of people that do. And to the extent that a rule, particularly a recording rule, is changing the dynamics in the countryside of who, who can accept text and email communications versus who can't accept them and decisions being made, um, there's a competitive structure that starts being influenced uh, of the availability of, it really becomes a market access issue that ultimately falls to the farmer, that in particular areas, I may lose the ability to have market access by the means of communication, not because I chose it, so it wasn't protecting me as a farmer, it's because the costs that are deemed by somebody at some point not to be worth the benefit for whatever their customer base is, and you lose a communications technology advantage that is a, an advantage that is very uh, good at the farm level. I can tell you I, there are a number of places on my farm where I have texting capability where I do not have voice mail capab or voice capability. I can't maintain a signal well enough to do a, a call, but I can do a text, because the text either goes through or it doesn't go through. And those, those places vary as you go across the field. And so I, I guess I would just point out that the rule is having implications, and we're hearing that out at the countryside that are totally unintended consequences of this rule and would encourage the commission to take a look at whether it's solving some of the uh, branch office issues, but also some of the issues of, uh, my guess is there are less direct FCMs that are willing to deal with farmers because of this. And so the options of market access through whatever uh, competitive measures are being unduly influenced by the rule. Any additional comments? One quick one. You mentioned um, the cost, 90, 90 to $50 a month. It, um, was there, uh, in, in that same spot, um, you know, footnote 91, does it talk, start talking about the benefits value you guys placed on it as well? The benefits weren't quantified in terms of a, a dollar amount. I mean, it's, it's I'm, I'm sure you can imagine, pretty difficult to put a dollar figure on market integrity and, you know, you know, preventing fraud and manipulation and things like that. It, 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 there, there, there's, a, there's a great deal of discussion on, on the costs and, and to the extent that uh, we were uh, given, uh, you know, some, some specific number figures, of course, they were very much put in and, and considered. Uh, in terms of the benefits, there's a great deal of discussion on that as well. Uh, Scott, I have a question for you in, in, in terms of, uh, like, your office that you handle um, orders th uh, from all your agents. Um, if, if, if you uh, utilized uh, this, this uh, technology, would you not be uh, uh, covering a, the uh, required percentage of, of calls and orders that would satisfy the, uh, the amount of the volume of trades? That, that would actually uh, maybe call into question at some future time. You know, uh, there, there's a threshold, you know, a materiality is, is an accounting concept. You know, there's a threshold that you could you can stand. Yeah, I think you're getting to what's the size and scale and, you know, the way it's written today, you gotta record everything. Um, majority of our volume is handled at the home office and probably the two, three other offices kind of thing. And I would also caution as you talk about the cost economic benefit, you can talk $90 a month per cell phone. Well, it doesn't sound like much. Well, now you're pushing $1,000 a year. If you got 20 employees and just in case you take a phone call on the way home, you now got 20 grand a year. I mean, it starts to add up in a hurry. You know, monthly charges don't look like a lot, but they multiply fast.
Um, down the road, if, if I have an app for my phone where I can enter trades in, I imagine there's an electronic tracking of that since it is a trade. So, I mean, as I see technology coming, I mean, I already on my home computer do all of my own hedging through a program that the broker gives me. So, I mean, it, it makes it very simple, and I can see it being an app on a phone pretty quick. And so is all of this kind of a mute point? If down the road, I guess we can all just enter in from our phone and do these transactions, and we're done. Kurt, Kurt I'll, I'll react this way. I think you're absolutely right. I think that whether it's Globex at CMA or whatever that uh, platform is at ICE or elsewhere that they have, Oh, I mean, a, a farmer sitting on their tractor in Iowa can use an app, probably even today, uh, to to do that transaction. And then, and then there is a, an audit trail over at the exchange. Um, and in in uh, most large offices, this branch issue is an important one. But in most large offices, people are already voice recording possibly just to protect the FCM against some customer who says, well, I don't know what trade you're talking about. <laughs> you know, they might have been recording it just for their own risk profiles. Yeah, yeah, to protect against the amnesia trade. Um, so we weren't trying to pile on or do anything like that. Um, uh, it's just trying to capture the, the audit trail that's already there. And I, I do understand, you know, when you have one person offices, maybe we've got to address something. Um, and the text messaging and so forth is just a variation on the apps. Um, to, to have the, not the farmer, but the, the, the firms keep an audit trail and, uh, and not try to change it that the farmer can use whatever means to hedge the risk, because ultimately that's what these markets are for. They're for uh, commercial enterprises, whether they be farmers and ranchers, the Millers, <laughs> Um, uh, and so forth, or even just a, a local bank and so forth to hedge their risk, lock in a price, and focus on what they do well, which is, you know, innovate and, and produce, you know, services and goods in our economy. Um, I checked with my, um, my local elevator quick while we were here, and uh, they had estimated their cost at $20,000 per location. Uh, don't know what kind of technology they're looking at. More events, Scott. Thank you very much uh, for your. Try oh yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm actually, actually, more of a comment, and I guess, um, and I think Chairman Ginsley, I, I thought your comments about making sense out of this is really good. Thanks for that. I mean, half-person offices. How do you make it? But actually, I think for everyone in this room, the reality of it is, given the charge the CFTC's been given over the last few years and the scale of things, I think the real charge for the people in this room is how the CFTC goes through because how, how what kind of exceptions do you make for agriculture given given Euro futures and the Glo Globex or the scale of the markets and the scale of responsibility CFTC has? And I think that is that not going to be the ongoing challenge that it's easy for us in agriculture sometimes to say, well, we need to be car I mean, and for good reason, we need to be carved out because there are some real, there are some real issues that if our food and fiber system is going to continue to produce and manage risk, we have to do it kind of in a way that works with them. At the same time, we have to have integrity of markets because I think we're still suffering, at least in our industry, from the two events that shall not be named of untrust of the marketplace. And I think it's very, I, I congratulate you on recognizing that there are some, you know, fundamental things on the, on the ground that, you know, you can't have, what, what, why do we spend this much money when we're, when it doesn't generate it? But to David's point, there are issues of marketplace access that can change, change the uh, structure of agriculture, depending on can you manage your risk or not. And I guess, I don't know, that's how I see the world. I, I want to congratulate you. I'm glad you had this meeting. Um, it's too bad we haven't had one for two years um, because I'd also, the last parting comment I'd like to make is the fact that I think this group can serve 
as an advocate to the customers and the users of the marketplace, when we do get unusual events that happen, to help share information so that we don't, um, so we can retain trust in the system. I know, I know we use, um, because the hog business, we we're, use the CME, but um, when we had our events of the fall of 2011, um, we had a lot of communication with the, with the markets just to say, give us information, because we got producers out here with pitchforks and, and torches. And I think in the future, if, if there is an unexpected event, I would suggest that you touch on this group to help share information, because I think it can be a benefit to help keep the marketplace, um, keep the integrity of the marketplace, uh, realizing you guys are trying to do a hard job and keep it all in, all in place. So excuse me for my long-winded comments, but I wanted to get that in before the end of the deal. I'd also suggest the, the panel on the uh, consumer protection I think I would suggest you put that on the agenda next time because I think there's some issues that didn't get talked about here um, that could have been talked about that I think would have been beneficial. So thank you. Uh, I uh, thank you, and maybe this is the opportunity to thank Randy for c conducting. I, you, you run a sharp gavel, so it's, it's helpful. But to, to really elicit your advice and comments, um, I think... Uh, all of us at the commission, staff and commissioners alike, benefit from your input, whether it's in the formal setting here, uh, which we should do more regularly, as you said, um, or if it's uh, uh, directly to us. Um, please do not be strangers. Um, we need your advice and counsel, and we need it particularly because, as you said, as Neil said, so much of what we're doing now relates to markets like the interest rate swap market and the credit derivative markets, which are vast, uh, are truly systemic in size, um, uh, but the agricultural uh, uh, interests of hedging risk for the farmer, for the miller, for the producer, um, rancher, uh, are, are critical, and um, it's and it's also our origin. That's what we are. <laughs> um, we started in the Department of Agriculture, uh, but that's really what, what you know what this agency is about. And Mike Dunn's here trying to see if this city kid can say the right things, but and he'll tell me afterwards what I missed. Um, but it really is our culture. Um, so please keep the advice coming, and we'll take up the issues on the customer protection, this voice recording. Uh, the Dodd-Frank implementation and even these RIN markets, but other topics as they come, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Pro Professor Fortenberry and our staff for organizing us, and, and especially thank you to all the participants in your associations that have contributed thus far to our rulemakings. Thank you for your participation here. This was very helpful. Thanks. Okay, we about reached the end of the day. Uh, thanks very much to Chairman Gensler for sponsoring this committee. Um, I realized that I had to cut us, cut us off a little early on the um, customer protection uh, discussion. I, I apologize for that. I apologize to Vince and anybody else whose name I messed up this afternoon. I, I sometimes talk faster than I read, and it doesn't always end up well. Um, and I thank all of you for coming. Uh, I know it's a, a big time commitment, long travel for some people. Thanks very much for participating. I, uh, I hope you got some value out of it, as well as the CFTC staff and commissioners. Um, I will appreciate any input you might have on future meeting topics, including the customer protection issue. Uh, and we will be communicating with you on the most effective way to let us know, uh, get, provide additional in, input, and let us know what kind of topics and issues you think should be at the on the forefront the next time we meet. So at this point, I'm going to adjourn the meeting. And, oh, yeah, sorry. Randy, can I just suggest if you all can give Randy some sense if we were to meet, rather than waiting two years, but say in six months or something, and just uh, obviously we can meet sooner if there's a need, but just to figure out some dates. So rather than waiting a long time to put something on the schedule, let's get something on the Mr. schedule. Mr. Chairman, I, I try to conduct the TAC meeting on a quarterly basis, so if that's any standard, once a quarter. Commissioner Amalia, always setting very high standards. Uh, I, I guess I'm not quite sure what our options are. Do we know? Okay, we'll be in touch about that. So you might think about what the optimal time frame is. Is that acceptable? Absolutely. 
Okay. So at this point, I'm going to adjourn the meeting. Thank you very much for your time and your input, and uh, safe travels. Thank you.